city councilor and also the chair of the committee. Um, I uh, am joined today by many of my council colleagues. I'll list them in a moment. Um, but this hearing is part of um, the city council's annual budget review process, um, which is taking place despite the pandemic over six weeks, about 27 hearings. Um, it's, it's an important chance for the council to really interrogate the budget um, and think about uh, you know, how we're prioritizing our resources, especially in this challenging time. Uh, we do welcome public testimony. There are a number of ways that you can testify. Um, one way is by attending a hearing such as this, uh, attached to the public notice online. There's a Zoom link. You can join in the waiting room. Um, and then towards the end of the hearing, we will admit people from the waiting room to testify. Um, I do want to note that if, you know, sometimes these hearings can run long. If that's not convenient to you, you are also welcome to submit testimony, written testimony. So you can email it to ccc.wm at boston.gov. Um, or you can go onto the city council's um, budget website, um, which gives you an opportunity. Uh, that website is boston.gov slash council dash FY21 budget. That'll show you how to submit written testimony through the web portal. Um, you can also submit a two minute video, um, which we will append to a future hearing um, or informally tweet us your questions using the hashtag boss budget, BOS budget. Um, or testify at one of our dedicated public testimony hearings on May 26th and May 28th, um, each at 6 p.m. The 26th is about BPS and the 28th is about all the other departments. Um, if you are planning to testify, I just wanna be clear again that you need to continue to watch this on the live stream um, and we only admit people from the waiting room uh, at the end of the hearing for testimony. Um, so today's hearing is on docket 0588 to 0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket 0591 to 0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. And docket 0593 to 0596, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, so those dockets together make up the full set of dockets related to the FY21 city budget. Um, but today we'll be focused specifically on um, the Boston Public Library, on the Boston Center for Youth and Families, and on a BCYF revolving fund, um, which is docket 0605, um, so the City Hall Child Care um, Revolving Fund. Um, we would ordinarily have done these as two separate hearings, and I just want to note, um, you know, I think the council feels passionately about the work of both the library and the Center for Youth and Families. Um, and if it weren't a pandemic, we'd wanted to vote a whole hearing to each, but um, because of the time constraints these days, we've compressed them together. Um, so we'll begin uh, this afternoon with the Boston Public Library. We're joined um, by David Leonard, the BPL president, um, and also expecting to hear from Michael Colford, director of library services, Ellen Donahue, chief financial officer for the library, and Eamon Shelton, the director of operations, uh, along with Laura, I'm sure, the chief of collection strategy. Um, and then later when we turn to BCYF, we'll hear from William Morales and Varney Jules, um, William Morales commissioner and uh, Varney, the finance manager for BCYF. I also wanna note for anyone watching that we are also having a youth um, engagement and employment hearing at four o'clock today. We traditionally schedule that a bit later in the day so as to enable youth who might want to, to join us. Um, given that we've started this hearing a little bit late, I expect we may start that one a little bit late. So I just wanna um, flag that for those who are interested in participating. So without further ado, I want to recognize um, David Leonard and his team and say that one of the casualties of this process is, you know, he, so he is currently sitting in the central branch. Um, and when we had planned for these hearings back in what feels a lifetime ago before this whole crisis, we had um, planned to have the BPL council hearing at the newly renovated central library branch, um, which would have been a delight. So sorry to be foregoing that. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, Councillor Bach. We have um, four of our colleagues whose names you read out who are waiting for admission to this part of ah. the um, <laughs> Zoom session. Uh, that's Laura, Michael, uh, and Eamon. Um, so it'd be great if we could let them in. Yeah, no, it sounds good. Um, let's see. Um, they're, they're joining right now. I can see uh, that's working. Yeah, and if I'll just say if anybody, if anyone, if anybody is joining and has not come in yet because you've maybe got your name listed as I found something similar, if people could just 
This goes for members of the public as well. Anyone in the Zoom conference center should retitle themselves such that we know who you are. Um, do we have your both? We've got Laura, Laura, we've got Ellen. Who else? So we're looking for Michael. I think uh, Michael and Amen. Him joining now. Michael's on. Great. So. And is it, do we have Eamon? I think I saw him a second ago. I'm here. Thank you. Great. Excellent. All right. The full compliment. So thank um, you so much. Um, I have a few, a small number of slides to share. Is it okay if I go ahead and do that? Great, so um, uh, thank you, Councillor Bach. Thank you, councillors. It's great to be with you again. This is um, actually my, my, I believe, my fifth uh, Ways and Means hearing as president of the Boston Public Library, um, entering my 11th year of service uh, with, with the library, uh, having played different roles before. Um, this is a unique time for certain, um, unlike any of the other uh, times we, we've presented. Um, I also know that several of you are, are new to your role, so, so welcome. Um, I've had the opportunity of meeting with, with almost all of you, uh, but not quite all, so hopefully we'll be able to, to uh, finish that uh, set of meetings when, um, in person when, when we can do so safely again. Um, oops, uh, there we are. Uh, so just to recap, uh, this is the team that we have assembled today to uh, present and answer any questions that you have. Um, Ellen Donahue, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Colford, Director of Library Services, both at Central and across the branches, Laura Ermshier, our Chief of Collections, and Eamon Shelton, Director of Operations, whose portfolio includes both facilities and capital projects. Um, we submitted a uh, document in the Council packet uh, that detailed the accomplishments of last year. I want to briefly, in the interest of time, just highlight a few things. Um, on the collections front, um, um, mostly our books and materials throughout the system. Um, in 2019, we had a, uh, we lent 2.2 million items digitally, 2.8 million uh, physical um, items. And for the first time in the year, we're just con uh, uh, coming to conclusion on, we expect digital to actually surpass physical. And clearly with the last eight weeks of activity, um, we, we think that's, uh, that's, that's even going to be um, a greater gap than it was before. Um, also looking at year over year visits to our different locations, um, we see a growth from 3.5 million visits to 3.7 million visits. Um, again, putting both of those numbers together um, should leave no one in any doubt but that the library um, is both loved and well used and continues to grow as opposed to um, shrink in, in the time that, um, um, that we're in right now. We've also seen um, over the last several years, largely driven by the capital investment, thanks to the mayor and city colleagues, um, as we renovate branches, we continue to see traffic and usage increase. The most recent examples of that being uh, clearly East Boston and Jamaica Plain. Um, We've continued to put a focus on improving the library staff culture. And uh, one highlight in the last fiscal year was uh, having an assembly of all of the staff of the Boston Public Library in one place um, for we think the first time ever, certainly in, in recent history. So we had over, uh, over 400 people assembled here in the Central Library. Um, that now seems like a time uh, in the distant past given how social distancing is the reality of what we're experiencing today. And then on the next slide, I'll document just some highlights around our response um, to this, uh, this terrible pandemic that we're all dealing with and learning to live with for the, for the current time. Um, before I get to that, um, uh, I wanna note that in the operating budget, uh, which is before you for consideration, and hopefully uh, you will approve. Um, based upon the recommended budget submitted by the mayor in April, um, uh, 
uh, we see a, a maintenance budget that basically allows us to keep doing all the things that we did last year to continue to do that again next year, but with some increases. Um, additional custodial capacity, mostly in the branches, um, that is to fill some gaps around dual coverage, an additional um, librarian at our branch in Roxbury, uh, the Dudley branch, uh, that is budgeted in the city budget as a half-time position. We would use private funding um, to bring that up to a full-time uh, headcount and an additional uh, capacity uh, in the generalist librarian track for East Boston branch. Again, a, an area where we have seen such huge demand outpacing what the um, uh, existing staff is able to handle. And you see there what that turns into when you uh, look at maintenance plus these initiatives from FY20 into FY21. Uh, we, we are really pleased um, that the mayor in April supported um, uh, this uh, investment in the library. And you know we have fingers crossed that that holds for as long as it's possible to hold. In terms of our response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in, in, in Boston, uh, which we're now in, from the library's point of view, we're in week eight since we closed for in-person service to the public. Um, we immediately pivoted to online content and online programs. We have increased the number of items available digitally. Uh, we've uh, worked with the caps around certain content, which Laura could certainly address if you want more details, uh, to ensure um, all of our patrons could borrow more, uh, more frequently. Um, our librarian and library staff throughout the system uh, have been offering quite the range of online programs, uh, from children's story time to book clubs to uh, most recently we celebrated the Boston in 100 Words um, writing competition. Uh, this, this, uh, this past Saturday. Uh, in order to ensure that we could continue doing some work for our more vulnerable populations and continue to do that in person, uh, we launched a program called Books for Boston, where we were purchasing books directly from local booksellers who are otherwise closed um, and delivering them to organizations like um, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, um, the field hospital set up at Boston Hope at the Boston Convention Center and some neighborhood community organizations throughout the city, basically doing book care packages with a few iPads and Wi-Fi hotspots as well. Again, our piece in responding to this crisis for our vulnerable populations in person. Meanwhile, the balance of our staff continues to, uh, where possible, uh, keep our facilities safe, uh, begin the work of, of deeper cleaning, uh, working remotely, which is a, a new world for most of us, and investing in staff professional development during this time when many other duties could not be performed on site. The focus ahead for us is uh, one that desires to bring access back to books and materials, um, being aware of the challenges around K through 12 learning and just general youth engagement over the summer. Um, the digital equity gaps that we knew about and which have gotten new attention during this time, ensuring that anything, any stages of our recovery also bears the city's equity principles in mind. And we know that we have a huge opportunity to participate in the overall workforce development and economic recovery work that, it, that is ahead, while continuing to see where can we play a role for our vulnerable populations, knowing that we don't replace um, the other agencies and organizations for whom that's their primary mission, but where we can support and add something, that's really our, our desire to do so. Um, a few thoughts around capital projects, as I know certainly in past years, this has been of um, much interest and um, joy for many of our counselors. Uh, with respect to the uh, Dudley branch, um, I'll just foot, footnote that um, we have some questions about its name going forward. Um, however, it is currently the Dudley branch. Um, it had two months of construction work remaining uh, prior to the slowdown um, and stoppage of public construction work. Uh, once that starts back up again, we'll, it will, uh, and this will be true of many of the projects, uh, work with our colleagues at Public Facilities Department 
and the various construction firms to reset timelines and predict, predict, predict new dates for, uh, for completion. Um, this also applies to both the Adams Street branch and Rosnaldale branch, which are both in construction, one new construction, one a renovation. Uh, we have work um, teed up for uh, fixing part of the building at Hyde Park. Um, our Faneuil branch is uh, continuing down its design um, stage, and there's no real delay at this point as uh, design is something that can continue remotely. Uh, the Fields Corner branch will also go into design. You'll see that in the capital budget as proposed um, to, to begin in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the sec next slide highlights projects at the Central Library. Our rare books department uh, would have been projected to complete and reopen in late 2021. Uh, we think that probably now will slip into early 2022 because of the, the uh, COVID-related construction delay. Um, some additional um, delays are highlighted there for the Johnson Roof Project, uh, Johnson Locker Rooms, um, the McKim Fountain, and we're just completing with, again, all with colleagues in our public facilities department, completing designer selection for the update to the McKim Master Plan. Uh, and then additional branch projects that are in various stages of planning or programming study. Um, the Chinatown project, which is a mixed use development. Uh, we have an architect on board um, to do a test fit study, uh, working with uh, the developer um, on that uh, project under the BPDA's um, authority. The Uplands Corner project, uh, we're just waiting to uh, see the RFP get launched for a multi-site effort in that neighborhood that is being led uh, primarily by the Office of Economic Development. Um, the West End and Eggleston programming studies, uh, designer selection for a, 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 a single architect to do both programming studies together is in its final stages. Um, the Codman programming study would then follow that one once it gets kicked off. Um, and then the other two projects, which although authorized or cash flowed um, um, this year, uh, will now fall into next year and the year following. That's for the South End and North End. And so at this point, um, uh, Madam Chairperson, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Um, I know that we submitted um, answers to many of your questions in, in writing, um, uh, but we're happy to uh, either uh, read those into the record, take them afresh, uh, take the ones that weren't, um, uh, weren't addressed in writing, um, or take new questions, uh, however you would like us to proceed. And Great. I can stop sharing at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, President Leonard. Um, yes, we did. Um, I will say we submitted uh, questions and um, got a large number of written answers back from the library uh, today. So I know that um, counselors may not have had a chance to fully peruse those yet, but if, if people could try to take a look at those. I also did want to um, commend and thank you for the, um, the very thorough qualitative report as part of your submission in response to our information request. It was very encouraging to me to just see the number of things that you all are doing in the COVID situation. Because I think it's it's easy for many of us to think like our, lo our local library branches are closed, um, so nothing's going on at the library right now. Um, and it was uh, good to know of all the work, especially you know continuing the conversation circles and the sort of various resources for people. Um, you know, I think it's really hard to lose the in-person services the library provides at exactly the time when they're so needed for people. I mean, with a number of people thrown out of work, with a number of people, um, you know, needing shelter during the day, it's, it's a real challenge and we're missing um, the libraries like crazy. Um, and I guess, uh, and I, I had also asked, we'll, for the public to know, we'll upload all of the questions and answers that'll be part of the record attached to this notice um, so people can see them. Um, but uh, I had also asked as the, historian on the council about sort of the research resources of the central branch because I feel very aware that if somebody doesn't have access to a university resource system right now that some of those public alternatives are suddenly missing mm -hmm. um, and so I was encouraged to see the answer your answers to my questions um, about just the number of things that you guys have been trying to get online and the and taking this opportunity to get some of those backloaded scans up and available to the public that's really really good news um, so I, I will reserve, I think I have a 
a few more questions, but I, in the interest of time, I want to go to my colleagues. Um, so one second, I can just pull the list up here. And also I want to recognize, I haven't yet recognized the colleagues who have joined us. Um, so I'm joined today by uh, Councillor Campbell, District 4, Councillor Flynn, District 2, Councillor O'Malley of District 6, Councillor Mejia, who is at large, Councillor Breeden of District 9, um, and uh, Councillor Isabi George at large, and Councillor Ricardo Arroyo um, of District 5. So really glad that they could all come. And uh, what we'll do is I'll, I'll jump first to Councillor Campbell. Um, and give her her five minutes and, uh, and we'll get rolling. So, um, Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Bach. And, um, David, thank you and your incredible team at the library uh, for what you're doing, um, not only before COVID-19, but of course in the midst of it. Um, I hope all of you guys are safe and healthy. Um, I, I don't have a lot of questions. Many, many questions were answered in what uh, Councillor Bach sent and the, the new process she's created. The only thing I'll keep bringing up is um, the Codman Square Library, which is such a staple in the community and some creative things have been happening there. Um, and I imagine with some of our capital projects in COVID-19, it really shifts timelines. Um, but I appreciate the continued attention on that particular branch in my district. Um, and we'll keep, of course, fighting for all libraries, but uh, this one I know has been um, on this uh, slate for some time to get some work done. So just wanted to, to raise that up in this uh, particular hearing. Um, thank you. I would just comment that even with the, the delays um, that we, we're all experiencing, um, once we get started, we, we want to continue down the timeline that was envisioned and uh, ensure that we do as thorough a job for, for each branch as we get to them. Um, that will be driven in part by um, by our capacity as well as um, uh, the public facilities department capacity, um, but um, but we want to we want to get to to all of them. I, I would um, just re-enter re this comment for many for those of you who are who are new as well. We did a uh, study of all of a, a high level study of all of the branches um, in 2012, and the current um, capital budget, which continues last year's capital budget means everything that we have, we flagged that needed major attention um, has gotten some level of attention by the time we get through this. So um, it's an absolute privilege for, for me and for the team to have the opportunity to, to execute on, um, on this capital plan for certain. And, and we're, we're committed to, um, to getting to, to each one um, as, as the funding uh, is approved and hopefully that we, we maintain and uh, um, as we as we can do so um, responsibly and thoroughly. No, thank you. And and lastly, I'll just say I appreciate um, the uh, work you guys do, couching it in equity, even hosting some of your incredible meetings um, in, in in Dorchester and other uh, local branches. And the intentionality around that um, is worth uh, a noting to the public. So thank you very much. And uh, stay safe and healthy, you and your incredible team. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, Councillor Campbell. Um, all right, next up, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach. And thank you to David Leonard and, um, and his team at, at the library. Um, first, I want to say thank you to David. And I want to say thank you to Mayor Walsh and his team in the City Council for their longtime advocacy for a new Chinatown library. Um, I want to thank the people of Chinatown as well for their dream of never giving up on having a library in that, in that community. Um, it's, it's a tremendous accomplishment and I know the people um, really appreciate it. Um, not only the Chinatown residents, but also it connects to the uh, South End. It also connects to the Leather District neighborhood as well. Thank you. Um, the South End um, Library, I know we've talked about that in the past, David, um, and recently about it. I speak freq frequently with Marlene at the uh, Friends of the South End Library, and I know she, she raised a couple issues that I know you're, you're working on, including, or the other team is working on, I should say, um, uh, Wi-Fi for Library Park, computer access 
the teens, uh, security in the restroom, uh, more magazine uh, subscriptions possibly. Um, I was there last year and they had a wonderful rededication of the new, um, the upgraded space. So thank you for that tremendous in, um, investment in the library. Um, and, and David, what's the short-term and long-term plans for the selfie library as well? That's also a gem. It needs, it needs work though. Um, so um, yes, we were thrilled to do um, what we initially thought was a, a minor refresh on the South End branch. And, and we were indeed able to open that um, last, uh, last calendar year. Um, with the participation of the friends and funding from the friends of the South End Library, we were able to do even more work um, on that particular location. Um, so we were thrilled to, to do that. And we, we know that uh, the programming study for the South End as a, a long-term, a longer-term um, uh, approach is, is, the, is the right next step there. And I did indicate that we're, that's, in our, that's in our sequence and um, you know, we'll, we, we'll, uh, we'll be teeing that, teeing that up. And uh, Marlene and the friends group there um, have been great partners on ensuring that um, that, that, that project is, is all that can possibly be. I, I, indeed, many of the friends groups partic part participate very um, uh, uh, deeply in, in all of our projects and any of our um, uh, projects during programming study and design um, has a community advisory um, process. Um, and it is really always encouraging to see ideas come out of those um, and some sanity checks as well, for sure. Um, with respect to the South Boston branch, uh, the, the one on, on Broadway and Southie, um, uh, two years ago, uh, we were able to do its more minor refresh, which for them, involved a redo of the courtyard space. Um, and I think our, having outdoor space um, this summer might be um, even, um, even more important than it was before. Um, uh, and I think in response to Councillor Campbell's question, I referenced the fact that this current slate takes us through all of the branches that needed um, um, a larger renovation as we saw it in 2012. By the time we get to um, the end of this cycle, we need to be thinking about um, those that didn't make the cut, if you will, because they were okay or fine um, in 2012. But um, I think, uh, I think um, both yourself and uh, Councillor Flaherty, uh, as he has expressed at previous meetings, would like to see um, uh, Southie in that next, in that next group. Uh, but there's much we can do in terms of maintenance and service and outreach to ensure our uh, branches um, are all, remain, you know, vibrant and dynamic and at the heart of the community. So in the meantime, we can continue um, working on it as is. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. And um, the South End Library has an excellent staff. They have a great team over there. Um, I enjoy going over there and, and talking to the, the, the employees, as does the South End Library. I, I share that library with Kim Janey, and it's an exceptional library. I love their dedication and commitment to the residents of Villa Victoria um, as well in their connection to the uh, cathedral, public, cathedral public housing. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you. Um, and know what I also like? like about your approach, David, is I've been part of these Friends of the South End Library meetings with you and your team, but you give them an opportunity to weigh in on what their concerns are and what their recommendations are, and you take their voice and their input very seriously. So I, I, I want to say thank you for the respectful dialogue that you and your team have with Friends of the South End Library. Thank you, Council Buck. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, all right, next up is Councillor O'Malley, and then it'll be Councillor Mejia and Councillor Breeden. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. President, team. Thank you for your great work. Um, I always look forward to this hearing uh, as a bibliophile, as someone who was raised partly in the Boston Public Library. I, uh, I just love the great success that you and your team have brought 
this is a fascinating statistic that you led with that I just want to underscore that for the first time ever, digital uh, borrows has outpaced physical borrows. That's remarkable. Um, and I think it really uh, sort of demonstrates the future. So I guess my first question is this, as someone who loves going to a library and holding books, I actually didn't, I'd never borrowed a digital, even though I, I read quite a bit, I'd never bo digitally borrowed a title until this pandemic, uh, and you know, Mr. President, because you were very kind to help me walk through the process in, uh, in terms of uh, figuring things out. But I wonder, are we now looking to increase, you know, the budget for licensing uh, of these online titles since, since obviously the wait list has grown on so many of them? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Laura Ermshire to address this question, but um, I, I'm always happy to try and provide personal technical support to our counselors uh, on this matter. So. Um, my, my wife was aghast when I said I, re I emailed the president of the BPL to help me figure out my uh, Kindle, but I knew you'd come through and you did, so thank you for well, that. I'm pretty sure I relied on my team to answer the actual question, so, uh, so there is that. Um, Laura, would you take this question, please, some character on the uh, shift from uh, physical to, to, uh, to digital and what this means for our budget? Happy to. Thanks, David. Um, you're, you're right, Councillor Malley. We've seen a huge increase in the demand for our online content, particularly in the last couple of months. And as we're approaching the end of the fiscal year, we've, we've shifted almost all of our budget for collections into online content, um, particularly since our buildings are closed. So we've added um, 13,000 titles to the online collection and spent over $350,000 on our online content. Um, and that's just in the last eight weeks. So that's really helping to um, add variety uh, and shorten the wait times that the that our patrons are seeing. Um, we've also increased some of the monthly limits on some of our other services. So Hoopla is another way that you can get yeah. eBooks, um, and we have Canopy, which has streaming uh, movies. And so we've increased the monthly checkouts so that people can get access to more content from them. Um, and I think looking forward, we'll definitely be looking at increasing the digital budget for um, next fiscal year, but also balancing that with the need to retain some um, some physical collections. That's great. And Laura, do you know, and you can get it to me later, it's, it's really out of more of a curiosity, the number of new pro, uh, profiles that were created sort of during over the last two or, or two months or three months um, to allow individuals to borrow things digitally? So um, we have, I'll, I'll get you the exact number. We've seen our online car, card registrations growing um, pretty dramatically. So I'll get you the total of uh, people who have signed up for it. I would add, we've also um, removed any sort of blocks or limitations. So previously, if you had like a fine on your account or had a lot of overdue items, you couldn't use your card to check out materials and we've eliminated all of those blocks so people can access the, the content. No, you guys, I mean, listen, you guys have been just outstanding to, to a person, every employee of the Boston Public Library reacting and being so nimble and, and figuring out ways to support the public uh, during this time. And, and I know that I, I, I've always been a pretty good reader. It's, it's part of my, you know, therapy to just unwind for an hour at the end of a long day, not listen to the news, not listen to me, and just, just lose myself in a book. So I really appreciate the great work you all have done. And, and honestly, to, to a person, everyone on your team has been remarkable. So thank you for that. Um, David, I know that it's around this time or probably early June where there's the big gala. Uh, it's a big fundraising piece of the, the Friends of the BPL. Obviously, that I assume has been canceled. Um, but is there a uh, concern about uh, how uh, donations will slow to a trickle in this economic climate in ways that we may, may need to support you through other means? So, so, we, um, uh, um, so we, we'd already uh, begun with our new uh, team at the recently relaunched uh, fund, Boston Public Library Fund um, to um, think about the right frequency for a large gala and they were already reaching the conclusion that for that particular event, um, you know, maybe every other year, or every three years seems to make more sense. There are different ways to engage with uh, philanthropists than, um, than the traditional gala. Um, I, I would note that the associates of the Boston Public Library did postpone their large uh, event. Um, they're hoping to do that in September currently, but um, 
as we all know, we live in, in changing and uncertain times. So we'll have to see if, if that is if sure. that is possible and viable. And if if people actually want to come together into a, a physical event of that size by the time we hit September. Um, in both cases, there there are um, there is funding um, from previous years that we will be, be tapping in, in both organizations. Um, and we were encouraged that um, the Books for Boston program that we launched and I described in my opening slides, that that's entirely funded by, um, by private philanthropy. So we've spent at this point over $20,000 and we can, I think, have funds um, uh, that have come in. And that's all from a couple of mid-sized donations, but a lot of smaller ones as well. And so I think this is um, our time to tell our story in a way that shows how, even though we may not be healthcare providers or social workers or other first tier responders, um, we're absolutely part of the civic infrastructure. And for some people, um, we believe that that will be an appealing message. Um, although the pressure will be on everybody fiscally, as we know, um, uh, in the time ahead. No question. I agree with, I agree with everything you just said. Uh, finally, um, obviously delighted to see the schedule of the Eggleston Square full renovation in the capital budget. Um, would add that I can, I'm, I, I'm 40 now, and I remember, I think, turning 10 when West Roxbury just last had a, a pretty significant reservation. So I, would, I will again urge West Roxbury to get into the queue uh, going forward for full renovation. And then finally, uh, Ellen, before we started this hearing, you shared with me some good news. I was remarking on the fact that my avatar picture is wearing a, uh, a shirt I received at the opening of the JP branch. And Ellen, can you briefly talk about, uh, to answer the questions of the, the uh, uh, countless individuals who asked me where they could get such a shirt, um, the good news? Well, we're not selling that particular shirt just now, but um, we did open a small gift store at Central with our uh, catering and restaurant partner, The Catered Affair, and uh, the t-shirts of the library. The little kids ones are very popular, and we just got some nice ones in that have uh, the book mural, if you know, in um, as you come into Johnson. Uh, the other very popular item is our onesie, which says, check me out, Boston Public Library. So That is adorable, and you, we have to end on that note because that's perfect. Thank you, Alan, David, to your incredible team and to all the branch librarians and staff. You do remarkable work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Mejia, and then it will be Councillor Breeden, and then Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Chairman Bach, um, and to the B... Uh, PLD, uh, PL team, we really do appreciate uh, your thorough um, presentation. I do have just very few questions. Um, first of all, thank you for um, your answers on hiring practices yeah. around language access. Really do appreciate um, your effort there. And in response, it was stated that your team tries to find candidates that meet the language qualifications. And I'm just curious to know how successful that has been so far. Uh, the other question that I have is that the budget narrative mentions a hiring challenge in regards to IT positions because of local competition. My question is, is there a possibility for apprenticeships or um, training programs to open up the pipeline for those in position? And then, you know, I'm going to be really honest. I think the, the, the first time I remember ever going to the Boston Library in Copley Square, um, I'm embarrassed to say was when there was a, a candidate forum that happened not too long ago with the, and I was blown away with how beautiful it was. And I could not believe that this was in Boston. And um, just curious, what if any outreach efforts are being made to create opportunities for more um, folks from different parts of the city to be able to experience that beautiful space um, and what the outreach looks like if any um, I'm, I was just like blown away. I could not believe that this was in Boston. I mean, I, I've seen it, but I had never, you know, I, it was, I, I didn't even, I had never really had gone inside and it was just like incredibly overwhelmed by, by how beautiful it was. And so just want to make sure that everybody um, in different parts of the city have an opportunity to experience something so beautiful. So just wanted to know what efforts are being made to do that. Um, thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll ask Michael to chime in on a couple of these points. Um, the, the language uh, uh, information that we were able to provide, I think um, there, there are also several of our staff people who 
are paid a differential if they speak a, uh, um, a second language that we need for a specific neighborhood. So there's additional data even beyond what um, what was provided that I think uh, I think is is helpful to this topic of broader inclusiveness. Um, and to your to your point about the central library, um, I I. Um, I, I personally sometimes feel that way, whether I walk in the old entrance or the new entrance, because they're beautiful in different ways. Okay. And um, it says free to all. So unless we're serious about the all part of that, which requires outreach, then we're not living up to our full mission. And so I think um, uh, we can do a better job of getting the word out about who we are, what we have to offer, and that these spaces really belong to the people of Boston. We're just the custodians of these spaces for right now. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I love the fact that maybe the counselors could help with, um, hey, have you been to the Central Library? Maybe, maybe it's a month or two from now that we can do that again, but, um, uh, but, but to be able to do that. Um, uh, we do try to think of this as one library throughout the city, even though there's a uniqueness and specialness to each location. Um, mm -hmm. But Michael, would you talk about the language and then the general work of outreach, which I think would be responsive to the councillor's question. Sure. Good afternoon, councillors, and thank you for that question, Councillor Mejia. Um, the languages we're 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 fairly fortunate for um, for many of our library assistants. We actually hire people in the neighborhoods where the branches are located, and um, by asking for that additional language, um, where they actually do get a um, uh, differential in their pay. We are, are pretty successful at getting many of the languages we need. We have fairly strong language representation in Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Vietnamese. I think we could do better in the Haitian Creole area, and there's some a couple of other languages we could um, probably do a little bit better. Um, but we're getting stronger and stronger. I think we've been much more um, intentional about it in the last two or three years, and that's been very successful. And um, in fact, during this period of time when we've been closed, um, several of our um, staff who speak other languages have been uh, translating many of our documents and our policies from home while, while we're unable to come into work. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, as to the outreach, I think a couple of things. Uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but when we, when we did a major survey in preparation for the um, renovation of the Central Library, uh, one of the questions was, you know, how often do you use your neighborhood library and how often do you use the central library? And it was very interesting to find out that while many people had a home branch that they went to, they also visited the central library. There was a great number of um, people who filled out the survey that said that they also attend the central library. A lot of families will come down on Sundays um, when the central library is the only library that's open for the children's programming. So I think, um, so to, to that, to that, I do. I'm curious in terms of what data you capture, in terms of just kind of racial background, because I, 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 I'm just curious. Do you capture that in terms of who's who's who's, who's um, frequenting that library? We don't on an ongoing basis. Uh, we we rely on the city data for um, neighborhoods. For this particular survey, as I said, it was several years ago when we were renovating the Johnson branch. We did a very large survey and it had quite an. Ex um, quite a reach. We targeted it towards non-users and users alike, and we got a very high percentage response. And I think there we saw um, a good um, coverage of many different types of people across the city. Um, but I think you're right. I think we, we have a team called the Community Learning Team, and their responsibility is to do outreach um, as, as all of our branch librarians and the librarians in our branches do as well into the neighborhoods. and. The outreach is twofold. Part of it is to actually provide services for people in neighborhoods who can't come to libraries or have a difficulty coming to libraries. And the other part of it is really to um, make sure everyone understands what is available to them both at their neighborhood branch and at the central library. So um, that is definitely something we do. I, I, one more question before I get the little um, buzzer here. I'm just curious in, in terms of uh, youth development opportunities, um, do you guys have a pipeline where you're creating opportunities for young people to learn about this as, as, as a career? And are you looking to um, expand that or it, does it exist? Um, so let me, let me take that briefly um, and also answer the, 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 the 
third part of your initial question, which related to IT and uh, uh, actually looking at our existing IT department, two of the key positions actually were promotions from, um, from non-IT roles within the library. So, so we are doing some, but it's more informal, and I would actually like to move that to a more formal program. I know several of our um, uh, union colleagues have been asking for that for some time, so I would like to add that. Um, we have been working on a stronger relationship with um, Simmons University which is the university in Boston that has a library uh, and information science program um, about um, possibly having um, opportunities for, uh, maybe even scholarships for um, candidates to pursue their degree uh, in combination with interning and working here at the library. So we don't have, um, we don't have all of the details settled on what that would look like. Um, but both of our unions are also interested in seeing, um, seeing what, what that would look like if we can get the terms right. So, so I think there's a great opportunity on that front. Um, however, with respect to the higher level IT positions, for example, trying to hire a software developer right now, um, that's, um, that is certainly subject to the challenges that we see in the, in the general marketplace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, yes, and just, I, I realized that, uh, this is a carryover from our prior hearing, so the um, the administration folks may not know just that the way we do time on the council side is that after five minutes, I hold up a gavel, and then two minutes later, that chime alarm will go off. Um, so it's just meant to help my colleagues um, keep to time, and if the chime goes off when you're in the middle of speaking, please feel free to finish what you're saying, but then just uh, wrap up so we can get everybody. I hate to find out what the thing that follows the chime is after that. So. Oh, it's, it's, it's this. <laughs> that that's what follows the chime. We're, we're trying to avoid that though. Um, okay, so uh, next up is Councillor Breeden, and then it'll be Councillor Sabi George, then Councillor Arroyo, and we've also been joined by Council President Jane. So um, thanks, Councillor Breeden. Thank you. Um, I'll try and keep it very brief. Um, thank you, David, for your very uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm very excited that we are going to be renovating the Faneuil Brightons Library and that we're on schedule. Um, we've been campaigning for that for many, many, many years, and it's going to be wonderful when it gets done. Um, I think the Faneuil is probably one of the smallest branches in the, in the system, but it's a very well loved and very well used uh, uh, branch and uh, I don't know if you've been watching the friends group in, at the Faneuil but we've been, had forty readings and uh, all sorts of fun stuff going on on the friends branch uh, friends of the Faneuil branch uh, Facebook page so it's been uh, we've gone off la we're um, not in the physical space but we're very much connected to um, the community through that branch um, I had a question you know we're going to be because it's such a pivotal uh, sort of crucial um, anchor in our neighborhood, the Faneuil branch. I was wondering, uh, and I think we did discuss the possibility of some swing space uh, during the clo time of closure, which we probably will anticipate maybe a two year period of time. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of after school programming that happens at the branch, uh, homework, help, and, and other things that given we are faced with some uh, loss of learning in our public school students, perhaps uh, availability of after school programming is maybe going to be more more, uh, more important going forward. So I wonder if you have any chance to think of those things. Um, and, you know, I think that's really all. I, I just want to commend your, your staff and, and all of the BPL staff for the great work they do. I'm so proud. Uh, to be associated with uh, the Faneuil Branch Library. And um, we're going to ha not have our funky auction this year because of COVID, but uh, maybe next year. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, w I was wondering how the funky auction would be thought of or uh, conducted in this, uh, in this particular time. But um, uh, certainly uh, we're, we're um, you know, Later in design, we will want to formally um, survey the community for which of the services are most um, relevant. This isn't always true in exactly the same way for each branch when it goes through its closing for renovation. So we will want to gather that, that data formally as well. Um, and uh, we've had great success in other locations where 
uh, there's been an opportunity to run a program at another location. Um, and so we'll certainly be exploring that. And I think, I think your team had identified a couple of um, possible locations. And I know uh, Michael and Priscilla, who uh, works for Michael, have um, started those conversations. So I don't have news to break or, or a result to report today, but we're very interested in exploring um, what the community is most interested in and where is it viable to, to, to use uh, on a limited basis, because we, we don't have budget to spin up a whole um, a whole branch, a whole mobile branch while, while a branch closes, but um, we'll be paying close attention to that particular need. Very good. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you Great. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Councillor Breeden. Um, all right, next up is uh, Councillor Asabi George, and then it'll be Councillor Arroyo, and then Councillor Janey. Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, David, and everybody else who's with us today. Um, I, I know during this time, or I'd like to know during this time where our libraries are closed, especially a number of our branch libraries, that we're also, um, those libraries are used certainly by patrons um, for lots of different reasons, but our homeless population in particular utilized our libraries for lots of different services, and over the years, your team has become much more responsive to fulfilling the needs um, of those individuals through some of the work that happened. So if we could touch a little bit of, um, on the support services that were in place and that we'll continue to invest in um, when we do reopen, um, it, both at the central library and at the branches. Right. No, happy to talk about that. And I'll, I'll ask um, Eamon um, to talk a little bit about what's happening um, with our social work team while we're closed, because that work hasn't stopped. And also um, we have an amazing health and human services librarian who works on Michael's team. Um, so we can hear a little bit about that work that is in conjunction with this Books for Boston program, which was really targeted at the more vulnerable population. Um, but certainly uh, uh, our intent when we reopen is to ex continue to expand that team. Um, librarians are not um, social workers, library staff are not social workers, but um, we are the um, connector, the safe space. Uh, in, in some ways, this is simply a new version of a traditional reference question. It may present differently, but it's a person asking for help or asking for where do I find information about housing resources um, or uh, day shelter or other, other care services. So, um, uh, so I think we understand how this plays in our, in our responsibilities. And certainly um, as we return, we want the equity lens and the lens of the more vulnerable populations to be first and foremost for services that we bring back first um, or second and serve and locations that we focus on. Um, Eamon, would you talk about Shiva's work in the, in the meantime? Sure. Um, thank you, counselors. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, so, so we have a, a very strong partnership with uh, staff from the Pine Street Inn and from uh, through the Department of Neighborhood uh, Services uh, or DND actually. And um, currently we have one outreach worker that uh, visits, that works full time at the Central Library and their primary responsibility is to connect our patrons with housing. Uh, but in addition to that, they also make referrals, whether it's to treatment facilities or, or other services, uh, whether at the library or elsewhere. Uh, this year, we added to that team and we had one uh, intern from Simmons College School of Social Work uh, join the program with an opportunity to uh, sort of build on our capacity. Uh, moving forward, uh, towards the end of this year and in the next fiscal year, we expect to scale up the program to uh, add additional outreach um, at, at some of the branch locations where there's need. Um, I should say that in addition to the one person, uh, Shiva Kaczynski, who's been great and uh, uh, as the outreach worker, we also have, um, you know, the sort of the full um, support of Pine Street Inn. And so in addition to Shiva, uh, the uh, the overnight teams are going out and uh, a lot of the um, sort of administrative staff are also uh, showing a presence at the central library, whether it's participating in some of our uh, meetings with the communities or, um, you know, um, 
building on the capacity of, of, of the outreach workers. So it's been a successful partnership. And has this been done, has, has this programming come about through the Homeless Committee that um, has functioned through some of your staff, interested staff in this? And then I also understand that over the last year, there's been some trainings that have happened around de for your library staff around de-escalation, uh, mental health first aid or mental health, um, at, you know, active um, standby, active um, uh, stand, standby um, training. Bystander and training. Some of those efforts, yeah, bystander training. Thank you. It, it couldn't come to my mind. So I'm just curious about the role of the homeless committee in this work and those trainings. Has that sort of reached and touched many of your uh, library staff? And if you could also talk a little bit about sort of the difference between what's happening at the Copley Library that has a higher seems to have a higher population of individuals experiencing homelessness and substance use disorders and mental health issues. But we also see that it exists in many of our neighborhoods. And, and because our libraries are central to our communities and often a place where residents can access different resources, the libraries also uh, have to respond to the needs of our residents too. And, and, that's, and that's why we're seeing sort of a change in the delivery of, of services a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Michael to pick up some of these um, these questions, but but I, I would also um, add that uh, we also rely on our city colleagues, particularly in the Department of Neighborhood Development and the Office of um, Housing. Uh, oh, sorry, Michael, I should go to you before the before the um, before the gavel comes down on us. So I'll, I'll yeah. try to be very brief. So um, with regard to the homelessness, uh, the committee that was um, really helpful helpful for us to get started, and people are still very much engaged. But with the creation of our health and human services librarian, she has taken over the bulk of that work and she um, has done wonderful things. She initiated with Shiva, our um, outreach navigator, um, weekly drop-in office hours for patrons seeking support services in the areas of mental health, substance abuse, and homelessness. And um, they've tweaked that model. That started at the end of last year. They tweaked that model until the beginning of this calendar year where they saw a dramatic increase in the number of people who would stop by for help. They also have um, um, legal uh, legal services centers there to offer assistance as well. So that has been a very successful program. She also does outreach visits to uh, four of the um, homelessness related services, Pine Street Inn, Women's Lunch Place, um, Black Seed Writers Group and Victory Programs each month. So we've really been able to expand this work quite a bit. I think we're still currently working on how to expand this better into the branches um, and that's definitely high on our list of exploration. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And I'd love to, maybe offline, if I could be connected, I'd love to be able to be supportive of her efforts um, across across all branches. I do have another question. I'll save it. A quick question for the next round. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Savvy George, uh, Councillor Arroyo, and then Councillor Janey. Thank you, Boss Public Library uh, officials and and. Uh, Mr. Leonard, for being here today uh, and the work that you do, you're sorely missed. Uh, and so I'm just going to try and jump into some of these questions. Uh, also, thank you in advance for these answers. I did have time to go through them, um, and they're very thorough. Uh, and so that kind of affects some of my answers. So uh, my questions, rather. Um, in terms of programs that the Boston Public Library has for folks who are staying at home or socially distancing, like the Libby app, which goes through the overdrive, um, I know that you've made substantial uh additions to it uh how are we promoting that uh at this moment in time where folks really could i think use these services and i i somebody who is an avid reader only found out about libby maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago before i ran um so what what are the things that we're doing to kind of promote these audio and uh uh ebooks i mean i think um certainly the the easy part is promoting this via um all of the social media channels but um, the next question is is likely going to be, well, how do we get it to the people who aren't already connected to us? Because that's really preaching to the choir in some ways. Um, so there are a couple of, of our uh, staff on Michael's team who have done some community outreach with, uh, we're going a little old school and doing some flyers um, right now to uh, really get the word out about um, either what the online content is or, or other things that we have on, on offer. Um, you can still call the library by telephone and, and reach a, a, uh, a librarian to get to get some help with a particular particular topic. So um, 
I do think one of our largest um, challenges um, is in general, even before the current time, but I mean, is simply getting the word out about everything that's on offer at the library. Um, I know our communications team is working on a direct mail campaign. A again, you know, not everybody um, is used to this digital world or this online world or has the resources or even time to participate in it. So, so a little old school outreach probably will, uh, will do us some good here too. That sounds great. Uh uh, just really quickly, uh, with time, I'm going to try and hit you with a bunch of questions. But first, uh, the early literacy program, uh, in your answer, uh, there was a pretty significant drop uh, in those numbers. But I, I believe it looks like it predated even COVID. It looks like it was a situation where it was uh, maybe there was too many things going on. How do we make that a uh, program that works in person but also online? Uh, Michael, would you mind taking that question? Sure. Sure. As I mentioned, we had a... Um, Due to maternity leave and two promotions, the, our children's library, which is incredibly busy, just had to, um, it takes a little while to get good children's librarians, um, to hire good children's librarians. So we did have a brief period last summer into the fall where we had to reduce our programming. So that's what affected the numbers. Our youth services team, I must say, was the first and the fastest of our teams to respond once we shut our buildings. And they, are, you can now check our uh, the Boston Public Library's Facebook page or the Children's Library's Facebook page, there are, they immediately pivoted to online story times and online crafts and online creative challenge of the weeks. So they've been very um, creative and, and quick to uh, really continue the uh, incredible programming that they do in person um, from, from, on, from home. There are also other partner organizations for whom this is their um, specialty of early literacy from an education lens and so increasing our um, opportunities to partner with other organizations should make our outreach stronger in that regards. Uh, so I'm I, just say, I was yeah, just going to say one last thing. Um, we're about to launch a major campaign um, called Future Readers Club which is really directed at um, caregivers and parents about the importance of reading to children before they go to kindergarten. It's based on a 1,000 books before kindergarten model, so we're very excited about that. What's the now. date for the launch on that? Um, we're, we're shooting for June 1st. Okay, fantastic. And so uh, these are all going to be lumped together because they're kind of the same thing or the same theme. Uh, we have a uh, construction going on in Rosendale. We have uh, the Rosendale Branch Library. We have some very much needed repairs going on at the High Park Library. Um, can you just give me a brief uh, idea on what the timeline is for both of those things uh, and where we're at with, I know we spoke, uh, Mr. Leonard, about the idea of vending machines or essentially something of that nature for books that are on hold and things like that um, in a pandemic uh, infected environment that might even make more sense now because it's less human contact. It's more just picking things up and leaving. Um, but where are we on that? I saw that it says we're exploring options on the options list there, so I don't know what that means. And then finally, um, more briefly, uh, let me just take a quick look so I don't lose myself here. Um, well, you can start answering those and I'll just try to find this and I'll jump in and, and throw um, it in. So, so Rosendale, we're still, we're still um, expecting an estimate completion in 2021. It might be later in 2021 than, than previously. And the Hyde Park project will have, uh, that will take about four to six months of, um, of time to do. Um, assuming we can get back to work this, this year, 2020, um, we, we still would like to see that done before the end of this um, calendar year. And with respect to the vending machine option for, at least for Rosendale to get us started, but maybe others as well, um, uh, we have uh, contacted the vendors and had some quotes and specifications provided to us. Um, so we need to review how well that will work with our existing technology and integrated library system um, and ensure that uh, we're not um, causing another um, staff capacity issue because staff yeah. still have to populate these and so on. So we're, um, we've, get, we've gathered the data, uh, we're reviewing if we could make it work um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. All right, so the last question was this, is there anything that you would like to do in this budget that it doesn't provide, if you had to pick one thing that it doesn't provide for that you would like to do with the Boston Public Library, what, what is that thing? Um, I, I would love to take that under advisement, um, but I, I do believe that 
this, as, as proposed, is a very strong budget and uh, continues to allow some of our most important initiatives to get funded as it stands right now, and that is additional custodial capacity that will be needed all the more in our recovery time, as well as beginning to expand our neighborhood branch team with a focus in this case on uh, Dudley and on East Boston. Thank you so much. And feel free to reach out to me with that question if you have something that comes up later. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, let's see, next up is Council President Janey, and then um, we've been joined by Councillor at Large, uh, Michael Flaherty, and so it'll be his turn after her. So Council President Janey. Thank you so much. And I'm just, again, thrilled to have this conversation. I'll, I'll never forget the feeling I had when I got my first library card when I was about seven years old. Uh, every day after school, uh, when I was going to elementary school in Roxbury, the David A. Ellis in my district, <laughs> I would have to walk to the Eggleston Branch Library after school to wait for my dad to pick us up. Uh, so we got our books, we did our homework, and I'm also thrilled because I've got great libraries in my district. While the Eggleston Branch is just outside the line, I do have the Dudley Branch and the South End Branch. As we know, the Dudley Branch is under this m massive major renovation, and I'm thrilled to see that it's almost done, would be in interested if this is the appropriate setting to have any updates on that. Like all of uh, the questions I've been asking in these budget hearings, I am very interested in the city's spend uh, when contracting out for goods and services, and I'd be interested in, in, in this department in that front, as well as um, you know for any uh, projects uh, that uh, whether or not we are meeting the BRJP goals in terms of projects like the Boston Library, which I did monitor uh, closely in my district and saw the numbers improve there as we did uh, that monitoring. Um, you know, with South End Library, and I think this is probably more parks, you know, there is uh, continued advocacy just around that green space there, but I, I won't go into that because I believe that is parks. I, I am not sure if I will be around for the next round for BCYF. I would want to elevate. I am very interested, again, in the spend um, there, as well as uh, the, the grants, the different grants, whether or not we feel like that it's enough, whether it's being used uh, effectively, um, et cetera. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, we're uh, looking forward also to reopening Dudley. It had about two months of construction wrap up left to go before we had to call a halt. And um, that plus a little preparation time once we can get back to work, um, we, we very much look forward to that. Um, I, I love your, your uh, personal story about that first library card. Uh, just looking at new card registrations for last week alone, this is being driven by the need to access our online resources. We had 1,937 new card signups at Boston Public Library. So if you can imagine 1,900 people having similar maybe um, feelings to the ones that you have, wow. I, think, um, I think there's no doubt that our, our services are, continue to be in demand as long as we can keep up with um, patron expectations. Uh, with respect to the spend questions, I'd ask our CFO, um, Ellen Donahue, to comment. Um, although I will note that for the capital projects, um, the staffing levels and uh, requirements are managed through the public facilities department and, and not, not ourselves in that case. Thank you for that. Sure, thank you. Um, we do intend to do better. Um, I would note that what we submit to, to the council uh, just shows the city spending and we do have a different business unit, trustees of the public library. We find more spending there. We also um, will continue to go to diversity fairs, but we also think that we're missing an opportunity in not checking the state minority women in business list mm. uh, for vendors to easily engage with who are uh, certified with the state, but not with the city to ask them to um, register with the city. Um, and we um, are reaching out to the vendors that we have now to see if any of them qualify for city certification and ask them to do that. And we intend to work more closely with uh, the Office of Economic Development, who does do the certification. Thank you. And to your footnote question on the South End Parks, um, the Friends of the Public Library, Friends of the South End Public Library are actually successful in uh, having their state representative um, allocate money last year to do the next level of um, improvement to the library park that accomplishes, that, uh, that accompanies the building there. And uh, our operations team and friends are 
are working on on executing that within the within the state time limits um, for, for that funding allocation. Yes, they're great advocates. Um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Council President Cheney. Um, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, I will now recognize Councillor Michael Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, David, uh, it's good to see you. Um, excited to see the 148% increase in the capital. Uh, been a long time uh, supporter of the Chinatown Branch Library, so I'm excited for, for that community, uh, along with the Adam Branch Library, as well as the Field Corner Library. So um, libraries are great assets uh, in our city, particularly in our neighborhoods. And uh, the important piece is how do we activate those libraries? So I'd be curious to, to get your thoughts, um, given that, uh, you know, we're, our, you know, our response here moving forward from the pandemic um, I guess what are the plans? Um, are you reassessing? Are you a re, are you re, reassessing your needs? Uh, does uh, BPL plan to reallocate more of their budgetary proposal to e-books and other digital services? Uh, what's the current decision-making process on purchasing e-books and digital services, and what limitations are there? I think that we're in a new world now with all of our kids now home, and as we start to kind of move forward, um, I think there's going to have to be a, a greater sense of uh, connection and engagement. Uh, from our libraries uh, to our community centers, to our schools, and into the residents of our neighborhoods. So I guess in the last part is, you know, what outreach efforts are, are going to be uh, undertaken to connect folks to uh, the, the, the yeah, very I'll, precious I'll, and valuable yeah. resources. Um, I will ask Laura to comment on the ebook purchasing, and then Michael to talk about outreach. Uh, but there's no question that um, uh, you know we will return as soon as it's safe to do so to in-person service across the whole system. Um, it's likely that we will stagger our services back and learn from what the communities are most interested in and prioritize um, those particular services. It, uh, we, we don't expect it will be business as usual um, on day one of the recovery period um, or, or for some time beyond that. Uh, we do agree that higher level of engagement is probably the right uh, thing to do. Um, and um, uh, doing so in an online world brings its own opportunities and challenges. The question of um, the decision-making process for purchasing eBooks, um, and we also look the same way for uh, downloadable audiobooks, which are, are also incredibly popular. Um, we have uh, a long holds list. A lot of people are waiting for things, so we look to purchase additional copies, co excuse me, additional copies, so that we can decrease the wait time. We also have take patron suggestions, so anyone can request a specific title, and if it's available um, and within our budget, we can purchase it. So we look at what the public is asking us for, and we purchase those. Um, we've also seen um, a shift in interest in our children's content, and we anticipated this certainly with um, the kids in Boston getting Chromebooks through the schools and just needing more resources for online learning. We've seen 177% growth in our children's materials since January for online content, and so we've, we've purchased a lot of content to help support those needs and working with BPS on um, summer reading lists and, and one class reads so, so that we can have the materials to, to support any of the online learning they're doing. And with the um, regard to outreach, um, our, all of our branch staff and the new department we've created called Community Learning are very much going to be focusing and prioritizing outreach. Um, we're really looking at some of our more vulnerable communities, uh, focusing on workforce preparedness and workforce development, youth and families, and then the literacy ESL and citizenship area for immigrants. Um, these are areas that we have seen uh, still a very important need while we've been closed and we've been doing a lot of this assistance as much as we can online. But as soon as we're able to safely um, get back out into the communities themselves, these will be the priorities that we'll be focusing on and, and really trying to get back to that in-person service and in-person work. Very good. I appreciate that. Obviously, all of our neighborhoods uh, have been impacted, um, and so uh, in all of our businesses, as well as all of our libraries. So, uh, making sure that we have a, a full court press uh, across the board, taking no neighborhood or constituency for granted, uh, would uh, I think is, should be the, the tone moving forward. Uh, David, just lastly, uh, Council Baker had a great idea a few years ago um, with respect to sort of taking advantage of our city resources uh, could be. Uh, 
libraries, could be our community centers, could be our municipal parking lots, right. and kind of repurpose them in uh, other uh, any thoughts moving forward with respect to are there any branch locations where there could be a creative partnership to create maybe some senior housing, um, you know, above or uh, some a small local business next door and or engage uh, or, or repurpose our, our municipal lots, particularly maybe in the evenings uh, for overnight parking or for uh, local businesses being able to park there uh, on the off hour, stuff like that. I just want to think out the box, uh, think outside the box as to how we can kind of repurpose some of our great assets, and again, Frank Baker uh, has been has been uh, the pioneer on this one. Yes, we we, we agree, and um, several of the uh, library capital programming studies that uh, are in the mix right now um, are formally examining the question of um, housing with public assets, as we're referring to this program. Um, we learned a lot from the Fields Corner um, programming study. Uh, with respect to what the levers are for successful um, use, the size of the site, um, the economics, um, the interest of the community, the zoning regulations, a lot of things like that. Um, and so I, I, while we probably will move ahead um, with a standalone renovation for Fields Corner, um, that will inform the West End, Eggleston, Codman programming studies that are either kicking off um, or um, or planned, um, and we 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 know that the West End community is particularly interested in um, in seeing um, something very creative happen um, on that location. So we continue to to wave that flag and ensure that any future planning at least asks the question. And with the cities um, uh, from a, at the policy level, knowing that more housing in the right mix is exactly what uh, what we need more of then that's what gets priority in terms of being coupled with a with a public library programming study of Very course, thank you david be its own version of that although it, it is a unique consideration of, um, of of projects as it falls under the bpda but that will be um all be well a library plus many other functions in a single construction very good. Thank you, David. Good to see you and, um, and good work with you. We love our libraries, uh, so keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you, you so Madam much. Chair. Thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Yes, and um, and David, you know that I've, I've inquired extensively about the West End Library Study. I agree there's a lot of appetite in the community for um, a really you know exciting uh, move there, both in terms of a world-class library and some affordable housing and use of the green space in the front. So. I just really want to repeat, just so everyone knows that I really want to be involved and involved in bringing um, the neighborhoods into those conversations as they start to kick off. Um, all right, so, and, oh, and I just, I wanted to highlight one thing just because, you know, we are, you know, publicly broadcasting, et cetera. And I noticed in your answers to my questions that you all have put both some of the literacy work and some of the conversation circles online the other language conversation circles. And I couldn't tell from the answer which of those you're having a hard time finding volunteers for to keep up with demand, but I thought we could use this moment to say, was it the, was it the language circles or was it the literacy that you needed more volunteers to help with? It's mainly the conversation circles because we're getting so many people attend them, it's hard to do it with just one person. And are there particular languages on that front? Um, with the conversation circles, it doesn't, you don't need to be able to speak another language because they're there to practice their English. Ah, okay, excellent. All right, so, so, and if somebody wanted to volunteer to help out with a conversation circle, what should they do? They could either email ask at bpl.org or they could call our main line 617-536-5400 and be connected to a librarian. Okay, great. So if you're watching this at home, if you want to help out with English conversation circles, happening virtually through the BPL, please uh, avail yourself of that opportunity. Um, okay, I, I want to, we, we've got our BCYF folks waiting and I want to move to their presentation. Will, uh, will counselors, anybody who has an urgent burning question for the BPL, you didn't ask, raise your hand. Otherwise we're gonna move to the BCYF. All right, Councillor Asabi George, I will count on you to keep it brief, but I will recognize you now briefly. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you again. I will be very brief. And uh, my question is around the Small Business Center at the Central Library. And it is a fabulous resource. It's really a fantastic spot. And with 
um, our branches, I wonder how we can replicate some of that or share some of those resources at our branches and just realizing that our small business districts are close to our branch libraries, our Main Streets programs can really utilize that space. I think it's a, it's a real opportunity to support small businesses, especially thinking about what's coming next as we hopefully find ourselves soon on the other side of this pandemic and businesses open up and will no doubt be looking for additional resources. I can quickly, Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough just yesterday, I had a meeting with um, the head of our uh, Kirstein Business Library and Innovation Center and the head of our community learning team and the head of our branch team. And the three of them are gonna be working very closely together to replicate and take what the Kirstein does and get it out into the branches. So we've been, we've been working on that. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, thank you so much. And yes, and I wanna thank again, um, the library staff and especially um, for answering our questions so fulsomely that really helped us um, with this hearing and also for waiting. Um, so we will move to BCYF, and I also want to say that we, yeah, you know, we want to, we know you've been waiting since uh, two o'clock, and we do want to release the BPL team. So, well, you're welcome to stick around. You should not feel obligated to do so. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to, yes, thank you all again, and move to Commissioner Morales on behalf of BCYF. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dave gives, it owes me a lifetime of uh, library cards for all the children I have. <laughs> for a line home to go first. Uh, but I appreciate to be here uh, to be before you to present our FY21 budget. Um, joining me on this call will actually be Chantel Ransom, who's our new Deputy Commissioner of uh, Administration and Finance. Uh, she's a local Roxbury native, um, BPL, uh, Boston Public School graduate, a uh, local who really understands our neighborhoods, understands our city, understands our residents, and is really eager to really contribute to the life of BCYF to make sure that that life is also spread into the communities we serve. Um, also we're gonna be joining me will be Pamela Lines, who's a, a product of the BCYF that began when she was eight years old and, uh, and recently was announced to be sort of the interim deputy commissioner of programs and development. Um, she's filling that role to support me um, as we're going through the transition and, and, and looking at trying to fill that position as it moves forward uh, to, uh, um, within our BCY scale. Uh, so thank you, Count Councilor Bark, uh, for granting us this time. And I appreciate this opportunity to present. Um, uh, before we start, we'd like to take a moment and, and, and really ask you to uh, keep our department in your thoughts. Uh, this year was particularly hard for us. Uh, we suffered a tremendous loss among some incredible legends who did a lot of work uh, in the city and especially uh, among youth. As you many know, Steve Roth uh, was part of our uh, street worker program uh, supporting us um, in regards to providing sort of the case management and support that the street workers needed uh, to do the work that they did. Mr. Barb Miller, who was a permanent fixture and did a lot in our communities for almost 30 years, um, unfortunately passed away this year too as well. And we recently lost uh, Mr. Bobby Joe Leister. And if you know who Bobby Joe Leister was, he was really one of the uh, the, the anchors here and worked uh, close to 30 years uh, in the street worker program. And Bobby's more infamously known as being one of the very first in individuals who was exonerated for being falsely uh, convicted for a crime that he did not commit in 1970 and served close to 15 years and came out with the biggest smile and her eagerness to make sure that young people didn't get caught up in the streets. And so it's been a really tough time for us in the last uh, couple of weeks and months um, as we kicked off 2020. So it was hard uh, for us uh, right from the beginning. Uh, and they were a part of our extended family. And so it's been an incredible loss for us. Uh, like everyone else, our world turned upside down over a month ago, and we quickly shifted from providing programming, uh, events and activities to helping our neighborhoods with the most basic needs. Our work lately has included showing up eager to adapt and help in any way. We have distributed until date over 80,000 meals from 17 of our sites um, and an additional four sites that are just doing adult meal distributions. We've delivered over 1,300 meals to financially challenged and homebound residents throughout the city of Boston. And we are exploring ways to continue to engage our youth, our families and seniors 
and creative ways. Uh, we've also been supporting other city departments. Uh, one of the benefits that we have of being one of the most diverse uh, departments is that we have a lot of linguistic skills. So we've been supporting a lot of other city departments with translation services around this, this pandemic. Uh, we've been assisting residents that are needing help uh, processing the unemployment benefits. We've been developing, we've developed and released a BCYF needs assessment survey to help us prior prioritize what is it that we need to do as we move forward um, underneath this situation. We've continued to work through our strategic planning process uh, that has been incredible and has been very well uh, uh, received and, 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 and people participating in it. Uh, we've been, and also the most important thing is that we've been each other's support system as members of our own BCYF family have been directly impacted by the virus and we've had staff who have lost parents because of complications with COVID. Uh, we continue to plan towards a future full of strong programming. While we don't know when things will get back to normal, we are going to continue to do whatever we can to make sure our spaces and programs can come close to normal as possible. I am honored to be here before you as the commissioner of BCYF. And I wanna thank Mayor Walsh for his confidence in me for his support of BCYF and the important work that we do. I also like to thank Chief Martinez for his support and for bringing the human services cabinet's departments together to ensure that we are working together and collaboratively on issues that are important to everyone in our city. Under his leadership, we are intentionally supporting and guiding some of the most vulnerable populations we serve towards better access to resources information to put them on the path towards stability. It's been over a month since we ran our last normal scheduled programming and events, but I would like to take a minute to share some of our accomplishments this past fiscal year. We rebranded and reframed our street worker program in order to better provide supports and opportunities that promote positive behavior change. The new program is called Street Outreach Advocacy and Response Boston, SOAR. When it comes to programming, we've expanded and created many new programs, including bringing our free family gym program to six BCYF community centers this winter. It would eventually run at nine centers due to increased funding from the Boston Children's Hospital. We also expanded our Super Teens pre-employment program for 13 to 14 year olds and increase programming opportunities across our networks. We began a strategic planning process, securing input from the people, partners, and community members who know us best. We are scheduled to release the BCYF strategic plan in June to begin a rolling implementation towards the beginning, towards the beginning of the fiscal year. We've executed an MOA between BCYF and local community centers helping address inconsistencies across our sites and defining the role and responsibilities of site councils. We are continuing to work on improving and clarifying the operational needs of this partnership that helps us work together to have a greater impact on the communities we serve. BCYF continues to work towards data of being a tool for serving Boston better and as a way to tell our story to this end, Award, we were awarded a contract for a new membership tracking system that meets our data and operational needs, provides constituents to members with better services, integrates more seamlessly with other BCYF and the City of Boston systems, and will be able to grow and change as we do. We continue our partnership with the Boston Celtics Shamrock Foundation resulting in renovations to the BCYF Charlestown and Penal Community Centers. That makes it nine community centers that we've renovated and over the past few years with the Celtics. Now, I will mention just a few of the initiatives we have planned for FY21. Whenever it is safe to begin programming again, workforce development for the SOAR program participants is gonna be a key part of what we're gonna do this year. Funding that came out of this came out of a collaborative effort that's uh, led by the Health and Human Services Office under Chief Martinez, BPD, and some other partners to really look at uh, the area of violence very differently. We hope that SOAR's 
funding will help support a workforce development that specifically for some of those impact players that sometimes just need an additional support to get them back on track for a meaningful uh, employment. We rolled out the implementation phase of our strategic plan, uh, the reorganization of our aquatics program to begin to shift it into an aquatics division. Uh, we've continued capital investments in BCY facilities with upcoming renovations to the BCY of Curly, Matterhorn Community Center, and the Parish Street Pool, and relocation studies for new community centers in Charlestown and Dorchester. Partnering with the foundation for BCYF to continue to identify and engage strategic partnerships and secure new institutional sponsors and financial supporters to support our important work. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. And I am honored to be working with the mayor and working with a city council that is committed to working with us to create centers that are centered on transformative relationships. And I look forward to discussing our proposed FY21 budget with you now. Thank you, Councilor Mark. Great, thank you so much, Commissioner Morales. Um, all right, so we will now move into questions. Um, we've also been joined by our colleague, Councilor Edwards. Um, so uh, I'll, I have a number of questions, but I'll defer for the moment and jump into um, colleagues. So uh, Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Bach, and thank you, Commissioner Morales and your team for all that you guys are doing. Good to see you. I hope you're safe and healthy. Um, just to be mindful of how late it is, frankly, and, and, um, and to give time to my colleagues, and we have another hearing coming up. Most of my questions I could either email, but um, I did want to focus on just what you guys are doing um, sort of now over the summer post-COVID, right, with respect to our young people. Um, obviously, we're seeing an uptick in violence. I've been telling folks, while it's quiet in some parts of the city, in District 4, not so much. And we know how vital the, the programming that BCYF offers is, uh, how vital and critical it is. I do have a hearing coming up at some point in the near future with Councilor Janey and Councilor Mejia and all of the colleagues on the council with respect to summer jobs, but just curious as to what you guys are doing um, and how you're thinking about providing uh, summer jobs and programming for our young people. Sure. And then lastly, at some point, uh, and this may not be you, this may be for the next hearing, uh, Chief Barrows mentioned a survey that went out to employers around summer jobs and various things. And I did ask for it, I haven't seen it. So I don't know if you guys have similar uh, surveys or various things that you could share with the council that inform some of your planning, that would be helpful to us too, as we work in partnership with you and your team. Sure, uh, so I think that once we complete our, our uh, needs assessment, we could definitely show what that, that, that survey is telling us, what constituents are asking of us um, as an agency. And I think that the other thing that you were talking about was more uh, DYE specific, and I'll let Rashad talk about that because that, he has a separate hearing in regards to that. In regards to what we're planning to do is that we've been uh, moving forward. Uh, we, we, a couple of weeks ago, we assumed that April 27th was gonna be the date and we'll be able to walk in back into our spaces and be able to go back to 100%. But we've realized that that's not our reality now. One of the things that we're doing is that we're taking inventory of our program and trying to put them in buckets to determine which we can still kind of run and operate in person as we wait for guidance from the state, because as you know, uh, we work in partnership with several council and councils hold the license for summer camps or they hold the license in EC uh, for summer enrichment programs. So what we're doing is waiting for actually the May 18th day that is the date that the state's gonna release about what the new requirements is to work under the COVID-19 reality that we're in. But we're gonna hopefully support the council to ensure that we do everything we can to have our facilities ready, to do what we can to make sure that their capacity that they might be able to serve. But at the same time, if some of them feel that they can't, we're gonna to try to do what we can to provide some alternatives. Some of the other aspects that we've been working closely with DYE, and we're gonna find creative ways that the same volume of kids that DYE sends to BCYF will be able to hopefully host, manage, and create opportunities for them to have a meaningful employment industry that will probably be short in person or virtual. Uh, at the same time, we're still gonna continue to go with our 
uh, Super Teens program, which is catered for that 13 and 14 year old population that if it would have been a regular summer, and I think you guys heard me say this a hundred times, they're either too cool for camps, you know what I mean? Or they're, but they're definitely young for, for summer jobs. But they're, they're that group that if someone's not intentionally mentoring them, uh, Council Campbell, some will ill intentions will. And so we want to make sure that we can continue to connect with them and do what we can possibly. Uh, same thing with our girls programming. It's already been operating sort of virtually. There's been intentional connections with them, uh, connecting them to other girls um, organizations that have also created some virtual platforms. Uh, but all of this continues to move forward. Uh, we know that we're going to have strategic investments in technology so that we can be strong enough to deliver a, a virtual reality uh, experience um, for the young people that we're serving. But right now, our biggest competition as we phase into is going to be more finally youth focus at first. Uh, we know that the guidelines are going to restrict sort of the number of kids that could be in our spaces and the procedures that we might have to follow to make sure that A, we can run strong programming but with even stronger safeguards. No, thank you. And um, also, thank you for the work that SOAR is doing, right? The new uh, layout there and, and a lot of the you know, folks are on the on the front lines in person with respect to some of the violence. So thank you um, and look forward to sort of continued conversations. And I also want to thank you for participating in Council Mejia's um, session that she did. Some of my team members participated in that. I couldn't have had a conflict. So I appreciate uh, you showing up in that space, which was really helpful to my team members too. Thank you. Well, thank Stay you. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and before we go to the next counselor, I just wanted to say, so for everyone's clarification, there is a youth engagement and employment hearing that will immediately follow this one. It was meant to be starting in two minutes. It obviously will not be starting in two minutes. Um, I'll probably make this announcement one more time after four o'clock, just so people who turn on the live stream know that that hearing is coming. Um, it'll follow this one. So I would ask folks to keep their, the specific summer jobs questions um, for that hearing because Rashad will be there. I know we have some youth advocates joining us there. So I want to make sure that we're mindful of time on that front. Um, and, uh, and to that end, I think I'll, <clears throat> I'll just quickly slip in my sort of specific BCYF related question, um, Commissioner, and thank you for the written answers, um, I, including a very long one about SOAR, which I really appreciated. It helped me understand sort of what they're up to right now. Um, but I actually directed a question to YE that it seems like it's better directed to you all, which is, I, I was wondering about the possibility for us to do something this summer where we sort of, you know, every week send materials for some kind of like tactile challenge, um, arts or STEM activity, like, you know, to thousands of kids around the city, right? So like one week it's sculpting clay or like one week it's building a bridge between two tables or I don't know, just something where we could kind of generate some excitement and give people something physical to engage with. And it just seems like we're gonna need to be thinking in new ways about like what are individual activities you can do from home, but that then you can engage with other people about. Um, and it just seems to me like some kind of program like that sort of falls awkwardly in the space between BPS type programming and BCYF like youth is who it's trying to reach. And so I just wondered if you, how you guys were thinking about something like that and whether that could be a possibility. Yeah, I think we knew a while ago that we, were, we had a look at virtual programming as an asset. So I'm glad that you brought up TikTok because that was one of the things that we were thinking about trying to engage our young people, especially if you can make those TikTok themes. Like if the theme was give us something in your neighborhood that might be hope or give us something that gives you hope so that they can share and hopefully start creating sort of a community around that TikTok aspect. Uh, another idea that's been floating around too is to look at using technology and film. Majority of our phones have great iMovie kind of components. Imagine if our kids did a documentary and we named it COVID-19, my summer 2020, to finally capture the voices of our young people and what the impact has been on them in regards to this. I'm sure we're gonna hear stories about hardships um, that might be related to home uh, or the fact that they, they are also feeling a disconnect. Uh, trust me, I'm a father of five. They are feeling a disconnect from their friends. And, and so, you know, we have sort of creative ideas to kind of think about that. And other educational, opportunities too because we also realize that, as you know studies show that if a young person is not physically engaged in a activity or a program or a job during the summer months there's a lot of summer loss that happens academically 
And now we're talking about by the time they get back to the school in September, the good thing is what can we do sort of in partnership? So we're watching what BPS might be thinking of rolling out. We've been working with the Rashad Kofa at DYE as well to kind of figure out also how can some of our uh, virtual connection be also educational so that worst case scenario or minimum is that they may not get back to school at 100%, but they're going back to school much stronger than when they left. Um, you know, at least get them back to where they were, they, they were at and get them back stronger. So uh, I appreciate that idea because I think that that's what, that's what we're thinking here internally. And uh, we have a pretty good, decent uh, uh, program team here that's continuing to pick away at it and figure out it may happen. I mean, some of it might be that we may ask some of you guys uh, during the uh, Super Teens program to kind of talk about your roadmap and how you got to where you at, so that you get some interaction too, so that they get a familiarity with who their city council is and who's their voice from their neighborhood and create that connection. Um, since we have them captive now, right? And, uh, and doing that. Great, thanks. And I had also asked about, um, and you made a brief reference, but it just seems like, it seems like we need to shift also into more outdoor programming for the summer. I mean, to the extent that we're gonna be able to gather youth, it seems like gathering them in very small groups outside is gonna be our best bet. And so I know in the answers that were provided to me, um, there was a suggestion that traditionally that's been more parks and recs area. Um, and it just seems to me like a lot of our, our youth expertise is still on the BCYF side. And so I would just love a little more information on the extent to which you guys are talking about any collaborations there. Yeah, well, I, I think we, 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 we need to have more of a conversation with Parks and Recs. Uh, but the reality is, is that if we're running a summer camp program, we have to look at what the scope of the new requirements are telling us and what we can do or not do with young people. Um, you know, part of it is also that we just also don't know what the consumer faith is going to be. How many parents are going to be comfortable um, if their kids are outside or do they want them inside? But I think we have to explore that. Um, I, I think that if we formulate something, I can try to get back to you. It would have been an answer about the direction that we're going. We weren't thinking out at the, at the, at the moment because we've always known that out has always lived with parks and recs. You had the MBL, you have sort of their different camp um, offerings. Uh, uh, activities that they tend to do in the parks. Um, and so you normally you don't, you don't uh, mix sort of youth populations too much because of the simple fact that you don't want to have a sort of a, a collision of, of kids coming together and then all of a sudden one of our kids takes off at another camp. So we have to think through those things as, as we can uh, move forward. But I'll get back to you on thinking about what we, what we might do in the outside. Great. Yeah, no. And I just, it just seems to me like even there's sort of two questions. There's the question of at scale stuff, you know, for lots of kids. And then there's also the question, I think, you know, obviously we've done, we've had a history of doing some camping programs and stuff in DPS towards the end of the year for some kids. And the question yeah. of, you know, if you, if you got it, if we had testing and you got a small cadre of kids who could really use a like neat, intensive, transformative summer program and you took them camping for a week, right? We're not going to be able to do that with thousands of kids at once, but I think you know, the question of are, are there outdoor interventions that we could do for the kids who most need, you know, that programming would be interesting to think on. So I, yep. I, I'd love to, love to continue this conversation. Um, me and uh, my whole staff, we're all former summer camp counselors of some type or another. So, um, but, uh, but mindful of time, I'm going to now go to colleagues. So next up is Councillor Flynn, and then it'll be Councillor O'Malley and then Councillor Mejia. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Thank you, Commissioner Morales and, and your team. Um, Commissioner, um, BCYF, the Curley Recreation Center, South Boston. I know we've had a series of meetings on it. It's a big, something I have um, followed very closely. Um, important project. I know my, myself and Council Flaherty have talked to you many times. Um, what's the latest on it? And again, I know it's gonna make it's going to be an excellent facility. It does tremendous work, not just in South Boston, but all over the city. So thank you and your team. Uh, what's the latest on uh, the Curly? Well, on the latest, we still continue to go through design. Uh, as you remember, prior, uh, prior COVID, actually on March 18th, we were going to have a community meeting yep. uh, at, at the center. I, I think that uh, uh, we've had great community engagement, a lot of that doing part that your presence is there. Um, you know, and one of the things I always tell everybody, I'm really glad that the fact that the last time 
that building at TLC was under your father's administration. Right. So I'm glad to see you here uh, helping us, making sure that we can bring that, that, that building to its full potential. Uh, so right now, uh, when, you know, once we're able to hopefully think about a way that maybe we could try to create another community engagement aspect of it, um, we'll definitely hopefully bring that forward just to continue to keep people in the loop who have been interested right from the beginning, uh, just so that they know where we're at. Um, at the same time, as you notice in this fiscal year budget, we've increased the budget another $15 million. Uh, there's a lot of things that we saw that needed extra attention. Uh, some of that stuff is also resilience uh, uh, issues that we need to address. Uh, but hopefully we're still moving forward with, uh, if everything goes well, with sort of a, a shovel in, in the ground, uh, hopefully September, October, uh, to basically start getting that project really going and moving and get it done and completed. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and um, to Mayor Walsh and, and, and Pat Brophy and, and Trisha Lyons as well. Yeah. Um, my, other, my other comment or, or question, um, BCYF, Chinatown, um, uh, BCYF, Blackstone, the Condon. One thing I wanted to try to work on, Chief, is making sure our swimming pools are safe um, up to date, but also I'd like to work with the programming team, mm -hmm. especially on giving kids in the communities of color, making sure that they're, they're provided swimming lessons, instructions. A lot of my facilities are, li are literally related, uh, located in BHA developments, which I'm very proud of. But I also want to make sure um, kids from the BHA and you know, in all our kids can learn how to swim as well. Is that something that we can we can work on and make sure the pools are up to date functioning, but also we can make sure that our our kids are given good swimming lessons as well. Sure, I, and, I, and I think that's a good question. That's why uh, in last year's budget, uh, one of the things that we began to look at is sort of an aquatic assessment. Where are we with our pools? Where do we want our pools to be? And what is it that we need to put in them to make sure that we can yield the return that we love to see. I mean, uh, we have organizations that struggle year in and year out trying to find lifeguards. We have an opportunity to begin to coach these kids from very young, get them into some healthy competitive swimming pro uh, programs, but then develop them to be the sort of the future lifeguards that our city needs and deserves so that we can feed that pipeline because we're not the only organization that struggles with lifeguards. We have um, the YMCAs as well. We have the Boys and Girls Clubs. We have hotels. We have uh, private developments that open up their pools too seasonally looking for work. Uh, so we see opportunities there. And I think that this year, one of the concentrations we are gonna look at is no longer just calling our aquatics program a program, but calling it an aquatics division. And really hopefully trying to pull together a team that will look at programming, that will look at retention of lifeguards, training of lifeguards, and most importantly, creating the future pipeline of lifeguards. And that all begins with providing those swim lessons in those school buildings, uh, working in partnership with BPS to identify what time frames can we find, understanding that nationally we know that uh, one of the biggest killers of young people is actually drowning. And if we can provide those opportunities and get them into our pools and swim, it'd be great. I think we had this conversation last year that surfaced, I think uh, uh, Councilor Asabi brought it up too as well about trying to look at creating more swim opportunities for our kids. And I think that we're definitely gonna be there um, uh, this year because it's one of my commitments. Um, as you know, I came into the job, uh, three months into the job, and unfortunately I had the incident that happened at the Curly uh, with a young boy. And so it's been always my commitment to make sure that, you know, how do we, how do we uh, ensure that all of our kids learn how to swim in our city and, and provide that opportunity regardless of cost. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, and then my, my final question is, when we build, when a city uh, building is built or we're planning for a, a city building to be built, um, are you part of the conversation to see if there's any way possible we could have a BCYF facility in such a new building or what the relationship would be with, um, you know, partnering with the development team um, and seeing if there's a presence for BCYF. Um, you guys do excellent, excellent work. I just want to see the, yeah. the uh, I want to see it expanded. Yeah, currently, not right now. I mean, normally the way 
uh, some idea comes through the idea of having a BCY facility or looking at a remodeling one of our existing facilities or moving into a new neighborhood really is community driven. Mm -hmm. And then conversations start there. And, you know, and it's been city councilors who've helped facilitate that conversation even further. Um, at the end of the day, we're not the outfit that builds a building uh, or manages the project, you know, and or makes the financial decisions at, at the end. Uh, but of course, once uh, it's been identified that there's a need, of course, our team will be around to make sure that it's built to the specs to make sure that it's state of the art and that it, it, it's not only going to do it's not only going to serve the populations we have here today, but to think about serving the populations we will see tomorrow. Commissioner, thank you. And I, in my final point, not a question, I just want to say thank you to the BCYF team during this pandemic. They're still working, providing food to so many families in need. I love going by and saying hello to them and thanking them. They make Boston great, these dedicated city workers, BCYF workers. So thank you to those, um, those men and women that continue to work hard for our city. Thank you, we appreciate that. Thank you, Council Buck. Thank great. You, Council. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, and before we go to the next councillor, I'm actually going to allow, we just have one person who has signed up for public testimony, Alyssa Cadillac, who's um, the um, president of the Ask Me chapter at the library. Um, and because we've run so long, and I know that also President Leonard's been staying on um, to hear her testimony, I want to just allow her to testify before we continue with counselor questions. So, um, so Alyssa, just before you unmute yourself, I would just say if you've got the live stream on, if you can make sure to silence or turn that off, and then um, the floor is yours just for testimony back on the library. And you have to unmute yourself. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. I, uh, as I move one screen over so I can see, I do appreciate the um, uh, letting me go now. So my name is Alyssa Cadillac. I'm the president of Ask Me 1526 and, that, and also the training coordinator for the BPL. Um, Chairman Bach, committee members and counselors, thank you for your time spent doing the Boston Public Library budget and the work that you've done in your working group and beyond. Um, just before I put on my union hat, I wanted to put on my training coordinator hat for a moment and just mention that we did launch a web-based training called the Homelessness Guide for Library Workers for All Staff in January. Um, so staff are using this time. I know that came up, um, I believe it was Councilor um, Asabi George who mentioned that. Um, and we're also doing some additional conflict de-escalation remote training during this time and we'll continue to do that. So putting on my um, union hat, I represent the hardworking Ask Me 1526 members at the Boston Public Library. They're a very diverse group and their world language skills enable our non-English speaking patrons to use the library fully, including doing translation during this time. My members help everyone regardless of that person's situation. In the past, I've said that they do, sometimes at risk to themselves, um, help everybody, and that has never been truer than right now. My members are the ones who clean our facilities, staff our desks, and when we reopen, we'll be even more at risk. We're not babysitters, we're not daycare centers, we're not shelters or summer camps, and we should not be viewed as a substitute for those things. We are a resource for individuals, families, and researchers, and I think we have shown that during this time. The City Council must continue to advocate for proper staffing for our renovated buildings, and I urge you to advocate for an increase in those numbers, especially for my members. We support the idea of partnering with community and senior centers, but we do have some concerns on that, and we hope the council supports union involvement in these discussions. When we do open our doors again, I urge you to caution the library against closing multiple branches in nearby neighborhoods for construction, thus reducing access to our services. And with construction delayed, this will happen again. I am pleased to hear a question about the IT career training and then have David mention it, um, as I've asked the library about creating an IT career ladder with positions to help my members gain those skills and knowledge to advance higher positions. We do support training through our Ask Me Continuing Education Fund, but we need positions for them to be able to use those skills. I'm proud of the work my coworkers have done during this time. My members are the ones who interact daily with the public and will face higher risks of protection in these uncertain times. We are the face of public service in the city of Boston, and today I ask you to continue to support that we do and fund us appropriately so that when we do reopen our doors, we can provide the excellent service you have come to expect. I also ask that you commit to protecting the health and safety of AFSCME 1526 workers. 
maybe beyond what the governor's advisory panel might recommend. Since at this time, there are no true professional occupational health and safety members currently appointed to that board. BPL should not open our physical locations until the city and library can protect our employees. We are dedicated staff. We've been working hard during this time. We're ready to go back. We're ready to serve the public in person, but we need to make sure that we can do it safely. So please don't ask these individuals to unnecessarily put themselves and their families at risk. I do thank you for your time and your continued support, and I look forward to working with you um, in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa, um, and thank you for waiting patiently. Um, and uh, I'll just note to anybody else in the waiting room, um, if you want to pu testify publicly, we'll take the rest of public testimony at the end. Uh, Alyssa was the only person formally signed up. Um, but anybody who wants to testify should change their name in the waiting room to a full name, because right now there's a couple of just initials and iPhones. Um, so thank you again, Alyssa, and thank you to you and your members for all your work during this time. Great, thank you again. Great, and uh, now um, with that, I will go back to Councillor questions for BCYF. Um, so Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor and then it'll be Councillor Mejia and then Councillor Breeden. Thank you. Um, Kamish, thank you so much again to you and your team for just the exceptional work, as I said to the brave men and women of the Boston Public Library and echo uh, many of Alyssa's comments that she just made. Uh, the same can be said obviously for BCYF for just individuals who have gone above and so far beyond their job description, making sure that people of the city had access to food, safety, um, health, and we're just incredibly grateful to you and your team. I know you are as well, so thank you, as well as directly to you, uh, uh, Commissioner. Um, obviously, the, the program, you've covered a lot, and I know that, that there's so many uncertainties as it relates to um, some of the summer programming, indeed, even into the fall programming. So I, I recognize the fact that there are a lot of sort of moving pieces as we get ready to sort of plan things out. Um, but suffice it to say that I think now more than ever, having the resources available for BCYF and programming, particularly for our kids in these uncertain times, um, is obviously vital. So we look forward to continuing to, uh, to support that. Um, did you uh, did you mention anything about? I apologize, I, I had to take a call, so I may have missed it. But did you mention Camp Harborview at all in any of your sort of opening remarks? No, Camp Camp Harborview is not an operation of BCYF. It's independent, I believe. So oh, okay. That's not ours. <laughs> Fair enough. That saves me my my first question. Um, specifically on some of the centers, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Heat Street uh, uh, Hennigan Center on Heat Street. I know you know it well. Um, it's one of those difficultly uh, joint uh, buildings where it's BPS and BCYF. Um, we often get a lot of sort of finger pointing from the two entities. It's not, you know, directed towards you or BPS. It's just can sometimes uh, jurisdiction can be a little bit unclear. But I visited, I met with uh, many of the, the active members. I know you have as well, and I know we've had yeah. many conversations. Can you talk specifically about the Hennigan um, or... I guess it's a two-part question. Can you talk about some of the questions provided, or the, I'm sorry, some of the um, uh, difficulties that happen when you've got a joint BPS, BCYF facility generally, and then specifically as it relates to the Hennigan uh, ways that we can offer some improvements in the fiscal year ahead? Sure, I think that, I, I think what's happened is that we get a lot of transition of individuals that tends to happen. Yeah. Uh, and so what happens, relationships make things happen. And then when somebody moves, things get slowed down because the same commitments are not there. I think what's happened since the time that we, we looked at the Hannigan, we did a great walkthrough with Sam DePina, uh, with Bob Harrington and some other folks there, along with our team, and clarified who owns what. Yeah. And let's be responsible to make sure that we do our parts. Because when we do both of our parts, then we don't have any constituents raising any concerns. And so I think that once we clarified that, it made it really easier because we didn't know if we can touch the deck and drill into it, but we realized that we could. So we got that, that chair replaced. Uh, um, that was one of the concerns that was brought up by the group. I sure. think um, what's also happened too, is that uh, prior to that, uh, part of the administration's operations team over at uh, BPS and my team here really hammered out, I think a pretty good solid MOU that moves us forward and has us really thinking about when we're looking at the facility, Let's make sure we're all having the same conversation. It's better to have all the eyes talk about what they see than having one side of it only paint one picture. Yeah. Uh, because at the, end, at the end of the day, there is no excuse. We're all here serving the city together 
and we're only going to do it if we do it better together. So I think um, we've made a lot of progress there in regards to um, uh, how do we clarify that and how do we communicate better to streamline uh, attentions needed to the building. I mean, a great example this year, uh, you know, uh, we're going to look at, and this might actually go back to Flynn, uh, one of the investments that I think was approved this year was 2.5 to actually look at bringing back the Marshall Pool um, yep. that, that's, that's needed. Uh, I think I saw some money there too over at the Quincy uh, Center uh, getting its auditorium seating repadded and, and looking modern. Uh, because we all know that once people walk into those spaces, they don't care if it's, they don't know if it's BPS or BCYF. It depends who's the constituent and what they're doing in that building. At the end of the day, it's a city building that deserves to get the right attention because our constituents deserve the best at all times. Well said, well said. I'm gonna just, uh, I just going to cut you off because I, I, my time is limited, but uh, as I know yours is as well. Um, but thank you for that. I think, I think I take two, two points away from that. One is there are unique challenges when you've got cross jurisdiction, we're cognizant of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you're right, we're all city employees, no matter which department or whom we work for, it's, uh, we all are here to serve the public. And I know that's what you, sh you share that philosophy as does BPS. Secondly, as it relates specifically to the Hennigan, appreciate your work on that. I think that was a valid point that when people change those relationships, maybe uh, change as well. So um, we'll just be mindful and when things return to some semblance of normalcy, I look forward to revisiting this with you. Um, sure. Secondly, one of the most, there aren't many complaints I get around B about BCYF because you do do such a great job, but I am hopeful in this year's budget, you can say that we can, and I understand the reasoning behind it, but the money order rule has been a headache for so many of our constituents. I know you hear it, I hear it, I'm seeing smiles from some uh, of your colleagues and mine as well. Um, and I understand not dealing in cash, but can we at least allow for debit and credit transactions as opposed to simply money orders because that has been a barrier for uh, access to programming for many. Yeah, and I, and I think we've been in serious conversations with Treasury and we think that the new system that we're gonna bring on board is gonna probably grant us that, that, that capacity to do that. I will hold you to but, it. But, but at the end of the day, I will say, no one will be turned away regardless of their inability to pay. If I find out that happens, we're, trust me. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. And then, then one away. all right, well, I will keep pushing that. Look forward to celebrating yep. that with you once we get it online. Right. Um, finally, there was uh, the state had approved a grant for some um, city retrofits to build PV panels on this predates your appointment as commissioner, Will, so I've been hanging, beating this drum for years. There's state funding available that will allow for PV panels, solar panels, three community centers across the city that would then allow us to uh, maintain uh, battery storage for our public safety professionals. That's been sort of on hold since I think 2012 or 2013. If not now, can you get me an update to it uh, in the weeks ahead, where we stand with that? Well, I, I think we've had some modifications and panels. I mean, Rosendale and, and, and I know Tobin got outfitted with panels. What I can do is that I will have um, a member of my team really draft where we are and hopefully yeah. get that to the office. But so I know this, this was specifically summer. for Curtis Hall um, and yeah. uh, the Jackson Man, which of course is closing, so that may not be an option anymore. And then another one in uh, Bowdoin, Geneva area of Dorchester, I'm not sure, so we can follow up. Yeah. I, I'll check, like you said, it predates me, so I, I don't know all the language or what's happening around there, but we'll, we'll take a look and get something right. else. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley. All right, next up, Councillor Mejia, then it'll be Councillor Breeden, then Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Mejia. Hi, yes, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, Will, as you know, we go back to the early 90s in our youth development days and doing violence prevention, so it's incredibly humbling to be here today as a civic counselor and for you to be in the position because we have dodged bullets and lived these realities and so, I am comforted in knowing that someone in your position is uh, regulating and doing this work on behalf of our families and, and young people. So, so thank you for all that you've been able to me. Um, I just have very specific questions. Um, one is, as you know, we hosted a youth um, programming um, session that you were a part of, and we were, we've been talking about how do we transition into a virtual reality in terms of programming for young people. So just really curious in terms of uh, what your summer planning is looking like. Are we gonna be um, creating job employment? Well, that's for Rashad, but just kind of like how how can we transition into a family virtual site um, where there will be some programming for the whole family, not just for young people, because I know we 
talk a lot about young people, but I see I see these sites as the whole family unit. So just intrigued as to what, if any, planning are we thinking about for the adults um, who live in, in, in the neighborhood to really also be able to utilize uh, the facilities or your programming. So I'm just curious about that. I don't know if you wanna answer one question at a time or if you prefer for me to just go down the rest of the things that I have. I, what's your preference? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Pam Lines to answer. I don't wanna be one of those leaders who hogs the spot. So I wanna make sure that my team gets an opportunity because she's been putting her mind around a lot of new program initiatives. As well. And that's what leadership is all about. Thank you. Go ahead. So we released a BCYF needs assessment survey uh, about three to four weeks ago. Um, we're still, still open. We're still trying to push it out. I want to make sure that um, representation is covered throughout the entire city so that families, youth, um, seniors, everybody that uses our facilities are actually filling out that survey so we can get really good data. Um, that will really help us dictate how um, we can provide the services that are needed and throughout the country. So that's one of the biggest places right now. Um, our director staff that are at the centers as, lo as well as our programming and operations teams are all working um, pretty much nonstop uh, to figure out different ways and being really creative and thinking outside of the box as to how we can um, leverage all of our skills um, at the same time uh, provide different so some of our sites are face masks uh, to provide families we are starting a um, what do we call it the, the family care packages and senior care packages that we create for all of the families seniors and uh, youth that come to our schools prior to uh, COVID-19. So we have a new population that is coming day in and day out, but we still have to maintain and we're still caring for and thinking about the family um, and everybody that was coming to our doors uh, prior to So we're really thinking of the creative ways and we're in uh, contact with all of the as well. So that's really the work that's happening on the ground. So kudos to our director of staff as well you know, the, the work that uh, keeps us in the community together. That's what we're working on right now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I can't see Kenzie, so I don't even know if my time is up yet, but um, just- Not yet. Okay, two more questions. One um, is around some of the, one of the goals on, uh, on for BCYF was to expand language access and translation services. Can you explain how that will be implemented? And then the other question is, Another one of your goals was to create a social media campaign to share with all sites to offer summer slash fall 2020. Um, so I'm just wondering as a follow-up to my previous question, will this campaign also be a multilingual? Um, we, and you know me, I'm always open to um, collaboration and working alongside you all to implement any of these ideas. So just if you could, um, just talk a little bit about some of your language access supports. Well, I know that for the last couple of years, we've worked with the, la the city language access coordinator around a lot of our marketing materials and what we do and how we communicate. But I think that what we have to think of is that we have probably one of the highest diverse population, uh, service population in the city of Boston. So the language and the cultural sensitivity or connections are there at our site. Uh, you know, the majority of our community centers are staff who live in the community. They literally are walking to the site. They visit the store owners. They know the bodega owners. They get their nails done. They do everything in the neighborhood, and they know every little bit of detail. And the great thing about it is that they also bring uh, their language skill sets with them. And we have languages from Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Haitian Creole, uh, Somalian, Arabic, you know? So, that, so there's, a, there's a broad base of communication. And I think that what we've learned and what I think has surfaced that we need to really chat about more, and I think it's gonna be really intertwined in our strategic plan, is how do we utilize those people with those skill sets to help with the development of communication tools as we move forward? Because the reality is, 
because I could speak Spanish. But if I don't know the community, then I'm not speaking that community accent. Because the reality is they have to also understand what are the dynamics that happen within that community um, and what they do. So I think what, what, because of this whole COVID thing, we've seen our staff rise up and lend their linguistic skills to other departments. We have to figure out a way, how do those skill sets come back and benefit us as a city, as a, as a department? We keep yeah. and, and my last question, if I still have time, um, is that I'm just curious in terms of how are we identifying which sites, and this is going back to something that um, Councilor O'Malley was, uh, I believe, referencing to in terms of um, like updating some of our sites so that they can be more 21st century. I, I, um, I look at the, I didn't know that the Marshall was a site, um, but that's that's where I grew up. Um, and, I'm, and the Holland also has a site, I believe. So I'm just yep. curious about like, how are you doing assessments of this get what? I couldn't hear you because of the shine. And now the, I don't know if the hammer is coming down. <laughs> no, the hammer's coming down. The hammer's coming down. That's, a, that's all good. I'll get you at another time, but thank you so much. I'm all right. Happy. You're in your role, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia and Commissioner. Um, all right, and, and I will just say, yeah, so for anybody watching at home, we obviously haven't transitioned yet to the Youth Employment and Engagement um, hearing. That one will follow immediately after this BCYF one concludes. Um, and I know that we've got youth advocates planning to come there, and I know we want to have a robust conversation about summer jobs. That's just why I'm going to keep keeping everybody time. So um, Councillor Breeden, and then Councillor Asabi George, and then Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Breeden. You have, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, and thank you uh, for your great presentation. Very excited about all the work you're doing at BCYF and how you've pivoted to help in the uh, COVID crisis. Very commendable. Um, I'm Alston Brighton, District 9. I need an update on, on what's going to happen at the Jackson Man uh, Community Center. It's the only BCYF facility in our whole district. And uh, it's a great concern that we um, don't have a plan um, and there's no discussion. I know we're in the middle of a COVID crisis, but uh, the time, it's moving along, time's moving along. And, and is there any timeline for when we'd start a public process around BCYF uh, Center at Jackson Man and what the plans are? Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Brennan, uh, the thing I could tell you, I think uh, you and I had met briefly uh, prior to COVID in your office. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I know strongly that this is a, a sort of a priority for the city. Um, we know what population is there. Uh, it's my, my population. It was where my mother was trying to learn English so that she could move up the career ladder and get the skill set. So we're very much aware um, of, of, of who is in Jackson Man. And we want to look at what we can do to kind of preserve uh, our programming there. And so there's been conversations, of course, with BPS. Uh, there's been conversations with BPDA and conversations as well with um, with uh, public facilities department. Uh, we were going to come together and then COVID happened, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's been off our radar. Uh, I think what we need to do is just really sort of uh, explore when is the right opportunity to come back again and start having that conversation. Um, as you know, BPS has done a, a whole lot in regards because. You know, one of the things that we have to do is we have to define, identify where the space and the opportunity are, and that has to has to uh, get there. Even the current space that we operate now is one of those shared spaces with BPS. Um, it's not a, a, a BCYF building. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, of course, a standalone is always great. But even if we said we can build a standalone, there's still a process to, 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 to get it there, uh, meaning that feasibility studies and where is the, 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 the ideal location for it to happen. Uh, for now, I think that you know, we, we have to definitely go back and, and start having uh, the conversations again uh, so that this way we can use the time that we do have to think about where things can fit and what, what can stay there. We definitely want to continue to have a presence there. I think Jackson Man uh, is one of our, our stronger programs with the amount of adult education programs they have there, uh, the child care programs that, that, that they, they support, and of course the summer and the youth programs. Uh, that entrepreneur program that they have there that's part of our BCYF initiative, um, you know, kids who are selling that cream and, <laughs> you know, it's always great because I've always bumped into those kids every once in a while. So uh, I think that uh, when we have those conversations, I probably will be able to update you a little bit better. Very good. Okay. Um, yes. Um, 
it seems like a long time, July 2021 seems like a long time yeah. away, but I'm moving forward. And um, I really um, encourage a, a really robust public conversation because so many of our adults, I have uh, neighbors here in the neighborhood who um, went to volleyball as young uh, singles um, many, many years, 50 years, when, that, when the facility opened and now they're retirees uh, with grandchildren and they're still playing volleyball there on Saturdays and it's yeah. like it's 50 years. So uh, it's a well-loved and well-used center and I hope we can preserve it. The challenge in Austin Brighton, as you know, is just the availability of affordable land and developable land. So. Uh, Please, please keep me engaged in that conversation as we go forward. Um, it, it's a very important issue in our neighborhood. Thank you. I'll not take any more time, um, Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, Councillor Breeden. Councillor Asabi George, then it'll be Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Janey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Commissioner and your team for being with us uh, this afternoon. First, I just I, I look forward to the opportunity to be involved with the super teens again. I've done a number of their uh, graduations and other sort of celebrations and we posted them at City Hall and it's uh, it's quite the it's quite the experience and the adrenaline rush for me and a little bit of fuel uh, which is a, a really good thing just thank you for being a partner with the Boston Public Schools during this time with the food distribution in particular and I wonder you know one of the one of the asks I've received over the last uh, couple of weeks in particular has been how do we get more um, uh, supplies into the hands of our families around, whether it's art supplies, school supplies, sort of paper goods, um, crayons and pencils and markers and notebooks. And I don't know whether or not, I'll put that on your plate, whether or not that's something that we could potentially work on together because as kids have been out of school now for eight, seven, eight weeks, that's becoming a real challenge, I think, for a number of our families. I also uh, want to echo um, your desire and applaud Councillor Flynn uh, for bringing it up, the, the conversation that we've had a number of times around swimming and getting our kids both not just safe, to be safe and comfortable in the water, but to create potentially a job opportunity out of it. And I'd like to see a graduation requirement for all students to be able to, you know, to learn to swim before they graduate. We are a Harbor City and um, I'm really, I applaud this move from the aquatics department to the aquatics division, because it really is uh, something that all of our kids should have access to. And you know, there's lots of barriers to getting kids in the water. Um, I think especially girls in the water, but um, it develops confidence. It's a potential job opportunity and it's um, great physical, great physical fitness. So I look forward, look forward to that. Um, and then I think it was brought up earlier too by one of my colleagues and just want to double down on it that the the challenge sometimes around the membership and accessing membership through payment and again it's not an issue today but it was a few weeks ago where we on occasion and uh, we get calls about uh, residents not being able to access a membership without either a money order or some way to pay and, and cash wasn't an option and, and I understand the desire to keep cash out of um, you know, not sort of to having a cash business, but realizing that lots of our families, that's, they, they are unbanked um, and maybe don't have access. It, it's not that easy always to get a money order. So want to put that on there. Everything else is, has been asked by my colleagues and appreciate their leadership in all of these, um, all of these matters. I don't, will we be discussing revolving funds chair during this session? Um, yes, we will very briefly at the end of the session discuss. So yeah, if you want, if you want, if you I'll just get it out. I'll get my. So it's not so much. A, I guess it's a question, but it's a. It's really a concern around some of the revolving funds and, and those funds now that child care programs have been shut down. Um, you know, where does that leave us financially um, as an organization and as uh, many organizations? As I know, it probably impacts a lot of the front groups. But thank you to you and your team, especially uh, operating under what's difficult times. Uh, can't wait uh, to get the doors back open and look forward to being of assistance however I can. And if it means we've got to figure out a way to all of us jump into the pool together, let's, let's go do it and get it done. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to the team.
Hey, happy belated to the boys. <laughs> Thank you. They all, they're all missing school and they really upset about missing the baseball season at, at, um, at school. Yeah, so is mine. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll see each other at the baseball field next year. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Savvy George. Yeah, and I should just clarify the one revolving fund that um, we are technically dealing with in this hearing is the one for the City Hall child care, um, which is administered by BCYF. Um, I think while BCYF centers have other associated friend groups and funds, um, none of them are sort of formal city revolving funds that we uh, exercise approval over. Um, Thank you. And now uh, we'll be going next to, I gotta get my list up, um, Councillor, uh, Councillor, yes, Councillor Arroyo. And then it'll be Councillor Janey and then Councillor Flaherty and then Councillor Edwards. Councillor Thank Arroyo. you so much. Uh, good to see you, Commissioner Morales. Uh, and thank you to your son. Make sure you let him know we're proud of him over here, uh, oh. serving for us. He uh, just got and, married yesterday. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I saw the photo go up recently, so I just yeah. want to make sure I mentioned it. Um, also, lots of D5 in that in that camera, and I like it. So uh, just really quick, you guys did a great job kind of uh, answering a lot of the questions that we had before we got here. Um, and so I just have two questions, really, um, but they could take you a little bit of time. So the first one is just uh, on the contracts. I recognize that you use the state guidelines and that you go into the database uh, to see the available minority women-owned businesses. Um, mm -hmm. This is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I talk about this all the time. Our numbers aren't great. Uh, BCYF is sort of in the same place. What steps are y'all taking besides, you know, using the database that's available to you to try and recruit folks, to try and bring uh, people of color and women-owned businesses into the pipeline so that we can start actually involving them in that process? So what steps are you taking proactively to take folks in rather than just, you know, the list exists and who's on it's on it. But what proactive steps are you taking for these contracts? And then uh, secondly, obviously programming is real different right now. I know you guys are looking into it and, and you might not be much further than the plan stage. And I think that makes sense uh, because we really don't know what's gonna happen month to month. But what are the plans moving forward for what our kids are gonna be able to play or maybe not, you know, how are we working with sport programming and things over the summer? Uh, if we have to move to online, what kind of ideas, even if it hasn't reached beyond idea or plan stage, what kind of ideas are we exploring just so I have some sense of what's there? And then in terms of the budget, uh, in what ways can we help support that uh, for y'all? And the last question is just, is there anything that this budget doesn't cover for you that you would really like this budget to cover? So is there something that's missing where you would say, oh man, we really want this project we really like this program, something that this budget doesn't cover that you would, if you had to pick something where you said, hey, I could use a little bit here, where would that be? What would that be? And that, that's it. And thank you everybody for the work y'all are doing. Y'all are essential to us. So thank you. So I'm gonna try to take a stab on that. Now, you know, our expertise is not economical development or procurement, recruitment, and et cetera. Uh, we have to work with the city to kind of do that. And I know that in our spaces, there have been opportunities in where economical development has come in and talk to minority more, uh, uh, owners in regards to how that they can get registered and what is it that they're going to need in order to sort of be deemed a, a, a city of Boston uh, vendor to kind of do that. We, of course, will continue to work with whoever we work with. I know that there's a little bit of more flexibility that happens there, especially when we work with our councils who have uh, restricted dollars and are not restricted uh, to any sort of uh, state or federal or whatever guidelines when it comes to procurement. So we encourage them to always try to make sure that whatever dollars that they're gonna spend in regards to food, uh, items purchased or whatever, to start thinking about local and then looking especially that they're minority owned and so forth. Um, and I think the foundation, yeah. and the foundation has that practice too as well uh, with those dollars to, to make sure that we can give the, the, the individual who owns a Palma's restaurant the opportunity to cater a, a function or an event uh, but at the same time, uh, a young brother who's coming up and has a still screening opportunity that the foundation might do the business with those individuals. Uh, uh, and, and so we make sure that we can facilitate those. At the city level uh, means that there's a, another set of criteria uh, to make that happen. But we will continue to hopefully advocate for those aspects. Um, but you, you said the other question in regards to where we're moving forward. I think what we're trying to do is hopefully look at what summer looks like, 
look at what fall is gonna look like and look at what winter looks like. Hopefully, meaning that as we are continuing to go into these months, as, as the city does everything it, it can under the leadership of, of Mayor Walsh to really tackle this COVID um, uh, crisis. Uh, and hopefully we see uh, lesser restrictions on social distancing. We'll try to introduce as many programs as we can uh, that will make sure that the safeguards are there to do it in a very healthy way. Um, of course, we're gonna we're gonna always look at uh, public health, uh, official uh, consultation around that as we continue to move forward. But I think we all want to get back to normal, and and uh, and I know my staff wants to be there too as well. And I think I'm missing one question. What was the you had the procurement, you had the minority, and the programming. And then the last one was, is there anything that this budget doesn't cover oh. a program or some idea or somewhere where you could use a little bit more resources? If there was somewhere where you had to drill in where you say, hey, Councilor Arroyo went and fought for that in the budget, that was great for us. What thing do you need that you don't have right now? I mean, you're talking to us like we're, you know, we're a nonprofit like anybody else. I think we always want more money to do more. No, um, I know that. I don't doubt that you want more money for something. What I'm asking for is what, what would that thing be? Do you know? You could follow up with me offline if it's easier for you to do it no, that no, way. No, no. I think what I need to do is sort of divert that and give it some thought. I think that what's going to happen is that once we complete our strategic plan, uh, Royal, we're going to look at making sure that the strategic plan has some strategic investments. And I think that will give us a better picture about what we really need because what we really need is not developed by BCYF. The need came and that was identified by the actual constituents, partners, and staff work this day in day out all right i'm with you i just I, my goal here is to figure out what's missing in the budget that that you would like as an organization because that helps me figure out where my fights have to be um okay. you know, I, otherwise i'm just going to assume you love this budget and the budget is great everything's covered you're all good but i know well, that there's I mean, got to be places where you need some stuff and so you know if it's easier to do that offline if it's easier to you know i'm, I'm we can speak if i think it makes sense that you might need some reflection just as a, to assess where that might, where that extra funding might be needed, but just know that that's something I'm interested in. No, but I think that this budget, I mean, we did get some pretty good investments and we, we thought we were gonna get less given the state of COVID that we're in. We know that the city's making uh, some um, costs that are related to this uh, pandemic. And we were really surprised that a, a good portion of the things that we did ask, we managed to get. Which is awesome. So I, I, that always makes me happy to hear. So when you when you assess the budget though, and if you find somewhere where there might be uh, some beneficial addition, let me know. Sure, I will. Us Thanks. probably is better. Letting us know is probably better, but you can let me know too. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor. Um, all right, uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Janey had to go. Um, she did ask some questions up at the top with the library related to BCYF, um, many of which were related to the procurement conversation that. Um, Councilor Arroyo just had with Commissioner Morales, so that's great. Um, and uh, now I will recognize Councilor Flaherty, and then it'll be Councilor Edwards. Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Sir. Appreciate your patience. Uh, it's been a little hectic day, multitasking today, but uh, it's good to see uh, Mr. Morales and his team, uh, who obviously are doing uh, some great work. Uh, under some very challenging uh, circumstances. Um, I wanted to touch base on uh, the hours of operation. Um, I know a couple of years ago, we try to reorganize, if you will, the, um, the hours. Uh, it's very important that our community centers are open when they're needed the most. And I know that we had some community centers that were open during the day when kids are in school. And, um, and I know we got some pushback. So I, I want to check the status of, of that reorg and see um, you know, uh, if and, and how it's working. Sure, I mean, I, I think we've been minimized to one ship and serving food now. So we're not even operating during our standard regular hours. Uh, we anticipate, and, and the assumption is, is that as we're looking at the guidelines that are coming through, there may be a modification of our hours um, in regards to that, because the reality is, is we're not gonna have the capacity or uh, to actually serve the same past population, because it's probably going to be a less population, we may have to look at what our hours are there too. And one of the good things that came out too is that during our strategic process, that one of the things that was surfaced again was around 
the operational hours and really looking at the hours of operation to the community needs to be something that we will give it even more further thought um, as we move forward, Councillor. And then I um, want to reach out um, also and touch base with you and get your thoughts on, on um, as, as our child care providers have been shut down as a result of, of COVID-19, I've, I've got a lot of concerns, uh, particularly around smaller home-based daycare operations not being able to reopen uh, as a result um, of, of, of the loss in, uh, or the shutdown, I should say. Are we planning for an increase um, in need for our BCOA um, child care programs? Well, uh, the only child care program- and also, and I'll also add to that is that I, gotta, I have to assume, given you know, the, the, the furloughs and the layoffs and folks not uh, you know, getting a paycheck, et cetera, that uh, the demand will, will probably increase. Uh, I really could possibly even double. So it's uh, the amount of uh, child care programs that you have now I have to assume that you've got to be anticipating a much bigger number, um, you know, as we as we uh, kind of get out of out of this with the hope of God. Yeah. So to get back a little bit to to your child care question, City Hall Child Care is our one facility that's run by the City of Austin, and a lot of our other child care op providers that operate within our facilities are ones that we do in partnership uh, with our programs, uh, with our program partners, the council programs. Um, so that's a good thing that you kind of look at it. I, I know that uh, at least with, for what I've heard from third party, I know that one of the things that are happening at the state level is to look at that that date that the uh, that the governor issued, I think of June 29th, to look at it being sort of moved up. I'm not in those conversations to know per se what, what's gonna happen or not happen. Uh, the only one facility that I'm responsible for, I know right now continues to sort of be sort of a emergency personnel kind of child care should it need the rise to, to, to be to, to, to open and be used for essential uh, employees. Uh, but you know, it, it's a it's a good thing to, to sort of think, um, uh, to think about because I, I, I don't know what I know what the reality could be for, for the home child care providers. But I don't know what the state is doing actually to, to support them. And I'm city councilor live Michael Flaherty. And then, uh, and then also on the summer job side, obviously the, particularly yep. as it pertains to the nonprofits that uh, I've been uh, talking to, uh, they've got some serious concerns. Um, many of them, as you know, had to cancel their, you know, their spring galas, if you will. Um, so I know that they're concerned. Uh, I guess what's our plan? What's BCAF's plan with respect to um, as we again come out of this uh, for local youth programming? That our nonprofit partners will probably be struggling uh, to uh, to compete with. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to do as much as we can based on the guidelines we'll get from the state on May 18th. At the end of the day, we have to follow some strict guidelines in regards to how we deliver our programs and our facilities. And I think it's the same challenges that our nonprofit partners are having, like the Wise um, and the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and the other host of other organizations that 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 serve young people. Um, the reality is, like I said, the fair assumption is going to be that probably our numbers are going to probably reduce. Um, and it's going to create a gap there. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that we don't see too is that we also don't know what's the uh, where's the gray area of the consumer confidence coming back. I, you know, as a as a parent. You might have parents that are eager that it, 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 it's gonna that there's gonna be an opportunity for their kids, but you may have some that might not be ready to put their kids in a situation where they're in a group or in a gathering. So that's what we have to learn. Great, Bill. I appreciate the job that you do. Uh, you've always also also been very responsive and hands on, and you got a great team there. And uh, sorry for, for the losses that you guys have been dealing with as a department. Um, with respect to COVID-19 and um, keep up the great work and look forward to continued partnership. Uh, the community centers, as you know, are a lot like our community health centers and our libraries, that they're, they're the lifeline for a lot of our kids, a uh, place to go, a um, place to stay out of trouble, a uh, place to uh, get their homework done, uh, meet a, a mentor or a, a father or mother figure that may or may not be uh, at their own home. Um, and, and you look back and you talk to so many folks across the city and more often than not, they're going to point to um, you know a, a you know a youth worker or someone from from youth and families that uh, really turned it around for them. And those stories uh, continue to repeat themselves uh, year after year. So keep 
up to great work and uh, and you must be really excited i know i'm excited about some of the capital items that uh, that are in the budget as well so uh, thank you appreciate your time we, we appreciate you along with glenn and, and supporting us around the curly and the community engagement uh, meetings that we had thank you thank you councillor flaherty um all right councillor edwards you're up sorry i didn't make myself hi <laughs> I know I'm last. So um, the good thing is, uh, of my questions, most of them have already been asked and answered. Uh, I had like one, I thought, new one, and then Ricardo literally asked that one sweeping question about what else do you want in your budget? So um, I have- prove it. <laughs> Now we won't be. <laughs> I know, and, and I, I know I'm the last one. So I just wanted to make sure then to say thank you to Nicole De Silva, to Megan in Charlestown at the Golden Age. Uh, Nicole's over here in uh, East Boston. Uh, Steve Siciliano over here, over in the North End, all uh, the folks who work for you at your BCYF centers in my district, and I'm forgetting folks at the Marty Pino Center. I'm just trying to rush to say a huge thank you to all of you. Um, and ultimately, I, I am curious uh, only about one thing, I promise, and that is any programming that you have adjusted for the fact that now a lot more kids have Chromebooks and laptops in their houses. Mm -hmm. And we will most, like, most likely be socially distancing throughout the summer. Are you looking at possibly training them in coding or training them in other, I don't know, aspects, uh, not for jobs, Chairwoman, just for interest, okay? Are we looking at programming that's summer-based but on the computer that they can do at home? Okay. I'll yeah. let Pam answer. She's been... Absolutely. So uh, a lot of our sites right now, we're really looking to um, leverage our the expertise of our uh, computer instructors so that they can help create programs um, either specific to the youth that work with that they usually work with at their sites or centrally a program that we can expand throughout the city that um, young people can either log in, get some like kind of a grab and go of programming. So we're, we're looking at different options and that's definitely up in, in the listing of, we kind of want to create a, a library of different programs that, um, and activities that youth can, can either download or participate in uh, throughout the summer and into the fall. And honestly, I think, you know, from now on, mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, we everything has changed and we're just kind of, we're figuring out how to adapt to all of that and then still be able to provide the programs and services that the young people need. Okay, so, um, and may I just add thoughts about either uh, Rosetta Stone or some language programs, helping folks learn different languages, uh, CAD programs, helping design. Um, I had that as part of like school but it, it was fun actually and being able to figure out how to design and do architectural things and things like that it builds a skill set but it also is a form of, of enjoyment too um beyond you know Fortnite and other things you can do on the computer so that's it chairwoman thank you so much you're thanks. welcome <laughs> thanks councilor edwards okay um very briefly, I want to just, um, because this is technically the hearing um, for oversight of that city um, hall child care BCYF revolving fund, I just want to raise that material was sent over to us. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question about that, Commissioner, um, or to your staff. So whereas yeah. for FY19's receipts and expenditures were basically identical, the fiscal year activity through the 31st of March suggests that um, it spent about $200,000 more than receipts. And I just wanted to check whether that was just a question of timing about when parents pay tuition and then ask the question, um, is that open serving essential personnel right now? And just what's the status on that? The status now, it's, it's, sort, of, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of open through the state as essential employee, uh, but as a closed site, meaning that it, it, it hasn't yet, you know, gotten uh, operated yet on, um, but, yeah, it's, it, it continues to be sort of a, 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 a site that, you know, as you know, provides an, a, a, a key service um, to city and to city employees. And, um, you know, and, and like I mentioned earlier, it's currently right now sort of an, an emergency status uh, situation, and meaning that the state has uh, provided us some funding uh, because of the fact of where it is. Hopefully that helps really keep that gap that we wanted to keep it. Uh, but at the same time, hopefully, 
We are also seeing that we are also having some savings because of the fact that we're not operating during our normal operating operations. Maybe we can see that that might provide us with a, a, a further closing that gap. But, mm -hmm. but did, is, does, the, does the gap reflect parent tuition that didn't come in and that we're not collecting and therefore don't expect to collect? Or does it, or does it reflect just tuition that, like, I'm just asking, did we stop yeah. charging people? Like, what's our... Yes, yes, we did. We did stop charging people because of the simple fact that we had to go from traditional programming to emergency-based programming. Mm -hmm. And we went to emergency-based programming. The state has specialized funding to keep sites that they will deem or identify as sort of as emergency sites to still get sort of a funding a per classroom dollar amount. I'm not sure what that dollar amount is, but I know that that was sort of the stipulation that they, they created for us, um, and for us to keep it open. Okay, great. And, um, and oh shoot, I just forgot my other question. Um, but uh, do you, what's happened to the employees, that's what it was, of, the, of that site? Are they still getting paid? I got to give kudos to the employees. I mean, when it came time to transition from regular traditional programming to emergency, they continued to come in. They were more than eager to kind of serve the family. Staff right now is continuing uh, to uh, be paid, you know, even though they're not in the facility because of the fact that they could be called in at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Got it. Great. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Are there any, if any counselor has another urgent question on the revolving fund, please raise your blue hand. Otherwise, all right, seeing none, we are just gonna, I'm gonna um, recognize for public testimony. Um, uh, Maureen Gillen has been waiting this whole time. And then there are three people in the waiting room who have names that are like iPhone um, and initials. And so if, if any of those are watching on a live stream and are there wanting to publicly testify, if you can just redo your name as a, at least your first name so that I can recognize you, that'd be great. All right. Um, all right, we've admitted. Maureen is in. Just wait for your microphone to come on. Um, Maureen, if you're watching the live stream, if you can just make sure to shut it off before you testify, that would be great. Okay, and um, Maureen, I don't see your audio coming on, so I'm gonna just give it one more second. If you turn your audio on, if you'd like to testify, if not, we're gonna move on because uh, we've got, as I've mentioned several times, another hearing waiting in the wings after this one. All right. Afraid Maureen is not with us, so I am going, and I and nobody has changed their name. So, um, so I just want to I want to thank the commissioner and his staff. Um, thank you for waiting patiently for this to start and for staying with us so late. Um, and thank all my council colleagues for joining us. Um, you know, we'll be next be moving immediately to the youth engagement and employment hearing um, with Rashad Cope, and I know we've got advocates joining us. Um, and obviously, that's a that's an important other piece of the youth conversation we've been having just now. So I hope colleagues will join there. Um, and again, just wanna thank you, Commissioner, and your whole team. Thank you. Thanks. All right, this uh, meeting of the Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thank you all. And I'll just remind everybody that there is a different, different Zoom link for the YEE hearing, which we'll be moving into right now.